Dr. Lalit Mani, we are live now. Okay. Good evening, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, esteemed faculty and all the delegates who have logged in to our Sunday webinar. Uh, this is a regular feature that Delhi Orthopedic Association is running uh, for five months now uh, to maintain some educational activities for our membership. Today, uh, we are having a masterclass on uh, spine instrumentation and a galaxy of faculty who would be uh, sharing their thoughts on all the possible spinal instrumentation. Uh, we appreciate uh, interaction and uh, anybody who needs to put in a question, there is a chat box. P please uh, type in your question and the moderator will take it up and uh, put it to the expert panel as and when it is appropriate. So we would be covering um, the spinal instrumentation today and our uh, moderator is uh, none other than Dr. Kamran Farooqi, who, who is a spine surgeon, a senior spine surgeon at Ames Trauma Center. Kamran, next slide. So I would uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kamran, who is uh, MS Orthopedics and MRCS. Uh, he's a professor of orthopedics uh, at the Trauma Center Ames since uh, 2014, and faculty and consultant orthopedics at Ames uh, since 2003. He's had uh, various uh, fellowship trainings in spine, as you can see, ASSI, AOSpine, IGAS, uh, also uh, fellowship in Turkey. He has uh, various uh, publications in uh, peer-reviewed journals and has delivered various uh, talks all around the globe. So thanks, uh, Dr. Kamran, to, to accepting to take this uh, webinar and actually selecting uh, an amazing uh, faculty which is uh, around the globe. So now I hand it over to you to introduce the faculty of today's webinar. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Thanks very much, Dr. Lalit and you and Dr. Hitesh for uh, considering me to moderate this uh, spine instrumentation webinar. And at the outset, I would like to thank my national as well as the international faculty, whom I'll be introducing in a moment, uh, for sparing this time and accepting to be a part of this webinar. So, first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Ashish Chupadhyay. He will be talking to us about uh, cervical spine instrumentation, both anterior and posterior. So Ashish did his MBBS and Masters from Varanadar Medical College at New Delhi. And then he did his uh, MRCS from UK. He, after finishing his residency at uh, MMC, he went to UK. And later on, he did his residency at Chicago. So he did his fellowship in spine at Leatherman Spine Center. And then he is, and he has been trained in spine at Oxford uh, in neurosurgery at Shriners Hospital, as well as at Chicago, Louisville. Currently, he's working as a consultant spine surgeon at the Bristol Hospital, Connecticut, as well as he's a fellow of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. Thank you, Ashish, for sparing this time to be part of Thank this you. webinar. Uh, next, Dr. Bilinder Balin. So, Dr. Bilinder again did his uh, MBBS and Master's in Orthopedics at Maranala Medical College, and then he went abroad to UK, where he did his FRCS and FRCS in trauma and orthopedics. Um, he did his specialty training at MAMSI and then at West Midlands Rotation, uh, SPR training at UK, and he's done various fellowships. Uh, most of his spine training was at Austria Street and at Stoke Mandeville, uh, and he did his uh, traveling fellowship at various places, as you can see, uh, at Dallas, Japan, Germany, and uh, currently he's a consultant orthopedic surgeon and a spine, so considering spine surgeon at Robert Jones and Agnesson Orthopedic Hospital. I mean, all of us know about it. Um, it's a world famous uh, hospital. Robert Jones and Agnesson have developed the pioneers of orthopedics at Oswald Street, UK. Uh, he has a special interest in uh, endoscopic spine surgery and minimal invasive surgery, as well as degenerative adult deformity. Uh, he has published various, uh, he's got lots of publications as well as chapters in the book. And he is a supervisor for FRSTS or training. He was a clinical lead at uh, RJH at one time, and he uh, and I mean he is very very famous spine surgeon at <laughs> UK and well revered one. 
Then we have uh, Dr. Bhavuk Garg. Mm -hmm. Bhavuk is additional professor at AIMS, uh, and he's a consultant spine surgeon. Uh, he did his uh, MBBS from UCMS and MS at AIMS, and he uh, then got his MRCS uh, from Glasgow. Uh, as you can see, Bhavuk has published more than 280 publications with 39 chapters and books. Uh, he's, present, he's been a guest lecturer for over 200 lectures, and he's also got three patents, and he's been awarded uh, tremendously, almost 36 awards at various CSD therapy. He's got special interest at, in spinal deformities, degenerative spine infections. Uh, he's especially into robotics and MIS. Uh, and he's uh, a pioneer in 3D printing in spine surgery. Uh, and he's got special interest in gait analysis as well as uh, uh, orthogenetics lab. Uh, he's a member of various prestigious positions. As you can see, he's a member of SICOT Spine Committee, SRS Patent, Patient Education Committee. And he's a uh, Young Fellow Association Liaison Representative. Uh, he's got, he's been trained at various places, including Germany, he was a Robert Roth Fellow, ISA Fellow, and SRS Global Outreach Fellow. He's got various grants from DBT, ICMR, DST, CSI, and Emotrauma. So he's a well-decorated spine surgeon. Thank you, Bhavu, for accepting to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Karwal is currently the additional professor and head of the department at AIMS Rishikesh, uh, as well as he's a chairman at of MCH spine uh, course. I mean, one of the only MCH spine courses uh, to be recognized in India. Uh, he's been extensively trained in spine. First, he was a uh, registrar at AIMS New Delhi, then under, under spine fellowship at AIMS, and then went abroad to Singapore, as well as to Sapporo, Japan, Germany. Uh, he was the SRS spine fellow 2018, and his uh, his interest is basically uh, into spine deformity, and uh, I mean he's doing most of the spine degenerative work and infection. There are not many spine surgeons at AIMS, Rishikesh, and since he's a chairman running MCF Spine, he does almost the whole gamut of spine surgery. He's also editorial uh, on the editorial board of India India Journal of Orthopedics and Journal of Medical Evidence. Uh, thanks, Pankaj. I hope uh, you have logged in by now. Thank you for being part of this program. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Kashyap is professor at our uh, old alma mater, Almanada Medical College. He has been trained in spine surgery at Germany, uh, Japan, and he was a Buridal spine fellow at South Korea. He has got more than 30 national international publications and written several chapters in the book, as well as he is a section editor in IGO and he's an executive member of DOA. So he got heavy weight in the DOA and thanks, and he's got special interest in 3D printing as well as augmented reality. Thank you, Abhishek. So nice of you to be part of this program. Then we have got Abhishek Shrivastav. Uh, he's a consultant spine surgeon at Max Super Specialty Hospital. Earlier, he was a consultant spine surgeon at Primus and at India Spinal Center. Uh, he received his training at earlier at Ames, New Delhi. He was a registrar with us and then he did his uh, spine fellowship at Ames and later on went to Singapore to uh, get his training as well as uh, he was he received his training at Queen's Medical Center, Nottingham and he was a consultant at uh, Nottingham uh, Spine Center as well for about two years and then he returned back to pursue spine fellowship, uh, spine uh, field in India. Uh, he has uh, published many uh, you know, peer review, uh, pay many papers in peer review journals and given uh, as a faculty, he has been uh, on many uh, spine courses and all over India. Uh, Dr. S okay, and Dr. Saurabh Kapoor is the youngest of the spine surgeons here and he did his FRCS from UK as well as MRCS and Masters uh, in Orthopedics. Uh, currently, he's concerned spine surgeon at Sun Permanent Hospital. Uh, he was earlier trained and at uh, England, and he was a consultant at Queen's Medical Center, Nottingham, UK. Uh, he has special interest in minimally invasive spine surgery, motion preservation, and deformity correction. He has published more than 20 publications in peer review journals and chapters and books. Uh, he was a recipient of Global Outreach Fellowship of the ARAS, SRS, as well as the second award for British Spine Society in 2019. Thanks, Saurabh, for being part of this, and you're the opening batsman. So I guess it's time to start. So Saurabh, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, and I think you can start with your first lecture on history of spine stimulation.
Can you hear me now? Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the academic team of DOA for giving me this opportunity to talk on a very interesting topic, which is the history of spine instrumentation. Now, I would request you not to go through it like a chapter in history textbook, but to understand it as a journey, as how scientists, surgeons of the past tackled the problem of uh, spine surgery and the challenges through using science. Now, the 19th century problems was, first of all, that they didn't have any surgical solution because the aseptic techniques weren't still available. So all the spinal fractures would be treated with bed rest, traction, and immobilization, and many times the treatment itself was worse than the ailments. Hence, they started a constant search for answers, something that will make, uh, make spine rigid enough to allow early mobilization, something that will correct the deformity, and something that will will avoid, uh, will avoid immobilization and the use of external splints. So the early attempts of fixation is attributed, the first one, to Hadra. He, he was a German-born uh, surgeon scientist who later uh, migrated to US and did his, did his practice there. He was the first one who used silver wires to stabilize the sub spine and his, for his patients of port spine and cervical fractures. This was later improved by Hibbs and Albi, who improved the wiring techniques, and most importantly, they introduced the concept of arthrodesis in spine. They in turn the spinous processes, cut them, and then applied them over decorticated uh, posterior elements. The concept of arthrodesis and bone grafting revolutionized the spinal uh, practice and also meant that more fusion rates, the higher rates of fusion were achieved with the use of wiring and arthrodesis, but still there were a lot of limitations. The wiring only provided limited stability. The deformity correction was poor or none at all. The external brace and casting was still required for many weeks, sometimes months, and the rate of pseudoarthrosis was still unacceptably high. King in 1944 started looking for alternative anatomical sites where he could put uh, more fixation devices. So he started off with lumbosacral pesset screws. They provided semi-rigid fixation at best, still required three weeks of immobilization. The screws passed through the inferior facet right into the uh, S1 superior facet. The pseudoarthrosis rate was still more than 50%. Boucher, who was a Canadian surgeon scientist in 1951, described the first S1 facet screw that actually uh, went obliquely into the pedicle. This was the first time that a surgeon could actually uh, notice the potential of pedicle purchase, although it's not a proper transpedicular fixation, but it gave new ideas for surgeons of future. The pesset screws or the voucher screws were still only semi-rigid and the pseudoarthrosis rates were high. It required intact facets and lamina, and it, it was conspicuous absence of a rigid connector to enhance load sharing, which meant that you could only fuse uh, deformity in C2 rather than achieving a meaningful correction. Roy Camille, who was a French scientist surgeon, was the first one who was credited with using transpedicular screws. He also, he also used plates to cover the gap between the pedicle screws, and this, that's why he could achieve even partial reduction of his thesis. Now, he, he, he's the one who heralded the era of pedicle screw instrumentation. But as you can see, the plates had fixed holes and it was very cumbersome to place the screw at the right sides, but nonetheless, at least a start has been made. Macron was a Swiss scientist surgeon who in 1977 came up, with, came up with this concept of fixator externe, which means shan spins that go into the pedicles and they were connected to the external rods uh, with, along with clamps outside the body of the patient. Now, this was very, very cumbersome, but very stable and achieved very good deformity correction. Because of its cumbersome nature, surgeons and the patients slowly lost interest. And that's when, in the same institute in Switzerland, Dick came up with this idea of fixator interning. It was sham spins, but the rods were inside the body. This was very versatile. It could achieve a deformity correction in all the planes. And this was the forerunner, forerunner of the current short that we know of today. 
Thereafter, the flag was passed on to American scientist surgeons, and Steffi came up with this system in 1982. He improvised over AODCP plates uh, and introduced nests along the long holes that allowed variable screw placement at different sites. So these were the cancellous screws. It allowed variable multi-level screw placement, and Steffi is also credited with advocating lumbar interbody cages for the first time in 1988. This system was further modified again within America by different people, starting off with Craig, who introduced the VSF pedicle screw system. He was the first one who actually coupled the cancel screw with a rod rather than a plate. But what this meant was more maneuverability, more user friendliness, and better abilities to place the implant with minimum soft tissue irritation. Wilsey pedicle screw system then came up in 1988. It modified the screw heads to include saddle clamps that would allow uh, rod placement on either side of the screw, again, making it more user friendly. However, the final honors went to this gentleman uh, from Germany, who was Paul Harms, in 1989. He was the first one to use polyaxial screws on rods, and the ease of applicability and the versatility of the entire short segment fixation construct was unmatched. This is the corner of the current med modern pedicle screw system that we use so commonly. Now, while things were changing on the short segment front, the scoliosis instrumentation also improved and mirrored the introduction of new implants. Harrington in 1950s is credited uh, with the use of hooks to compress and distract long segments of uh, scoliosis attached to a rod. This was the first internal fixation system for deformity. And this stimulated deformity correction systems and, all the, and inspired all the future surgeon scientists to come up with their own ideas. The drawback, of course, was there was no rotational correction. Patients frequently ended up with straight back deformity and frequent revisions were required. The first derotation maneuver was described by Klaus Zielke, a German scientist in the 1970s. He used rod screws especially useful for thracolumbar and lumbar curves. And familiarity with the anterior approach was still essential. This Mexican scientist called Luke in 1986 came up with these ideas of similar wire and rods. Now this was an improvement over Harrington system because this was more rigid and it allowed better 3D deformity correction. The use of rods meant that you can do lordotic contouring and actually change the sagittal profile of the uh, spine. Many of the uh, surgeons, however, found it a bit risky because similar laminar wires uh, was passed on very close to the spinal cord, risking neurological injury, although some of it later improved with the introduction of neuromonitoring. Cottle and Debussy were the first one who used hooks and pedicle screws, and they developed their system in France in 1987. It was the first posterior system to derotate the spine, and we are all very well aware of the CD maneuver to, correct, to create deformity correction. Uh, this laid the foundation for modern three-planar deformity correction. And we all know that all pedicle screw constructs have become so very common. And uh, I would say that they have answered most of the questions that we started off with. It made the spine rigid enough to allow safe mobilization and corrected deformity very well, and there is no need for external splints anymore. Hopping over from uh, long segment tracolumbar and lumbar fusion, I'll come on to the uh, cervical spine, especially looking at the atlantoaxial instability. Mixter and Osgood in 1910 are credited with trying with attempts to fix cervical atlantoaxial joint for the first time using silk sutures in America. This was later modified by Gailey's Fusion, who was a Canadian scientist surgeon in 1950s, where he used wiring of C1 C2 along with interspinous graft, and that. Uh, remained uh, a practice for the next two decades for surgeons worldwide. Brooke further modified it in 1970s, where he actually used two graphs on either side of the midline, and this provided rotational stability. Again, this remained the state of the art for the next five decades, almost five decades, when Atul Goel, our own our, our very own Indian uh, scientist surgeon from who still practices in Mumbai in 1994 came up with this idea of T1C2 plate and screw fixation. But this was the most rigid of the Atlanto-Axial uh, fusion methods 
to describe it provided great rotational stability it provided good production of uh, dislocations at this level and there was no need for external immobilization harms further modified it in 1996 by adding rods instead of the screws and together we call this technique boil harms technique and this current state of the art now coming on to sub HL spine, Roy Camille again is credited with the first use of lateral mass screws. He's developed his own technique and introduced into 1983. He used the same plate uh, screw construct that he used in lumbar spine with good results. And, and since then, many of the other ways of putting lateral mass screws have come up. Talking about the anterior cervical plates, Orozco and Lovett and later Casper, who was a Latvian uh, citizen and later migrated to Germany to do his practice in the 1980s, came up with these fixed angle plates. But the problem with fixed angle plates was that they required bicortical purchase. Thereafter, locking plates came in, uh, which were much more user friendly. You could get away with a single, uh, single cortical purchase. And since then, they have come in different designs, etc. But the basic principles remain the same, and they are the current uh, state of the art. Coming on to the interbody cages, it's a very interesting story. Uh, started in America, where Bagby in 1977 uh, joined hands with Grant and Wagner, who were veterinarians treating horses. He was the first one to implant stainless steel cylinders in a horse's cervical spine who was suffering from cervical myelopathy. And they, uh, they were called Bagby baskets. He noticed significant improvement in the, in the symptoms and almost 90% fusion rates. And this rallied the age of interbody cages. Bagby and Kuslik, again 1989, again came up with new implant designs. This time they used titanium uh, metal. It was infection resistant. It had a much more favorable modulus of elasticity and was more MRI compatible. Since then, better quality products using uh, called peak cages in humans have uh, been used, were used mainly by Brantigan in 1992. Uh, peak cages were completely radiolucent. It has a closer, closer modulus of elasticity to bone, and hence the subsidence rates were much less, and has much, much better MRI and CT compatibility. Various designs of peak cages are now in use, and they form the current state of the art. Motion preservation or arthroplasty, uh, the history of which dates back to 1966 when a Swedish scientist, Fernström, first tried to implant metal ball prosthesis in between the joints uh, in order to preserve motion and avoid problems with fusion. However, as expected, uh, there were failures from subsidence and migration. For almost three decades, nothing happened, but Cummins in 1989 came up with a better design it was, called, it was called the Bistol Cummins uh, implant, and uh, since then, much, much, many, many, many more varieties of uh, cervical discs are now available with better fixation, osseo integration, and surface characteristic, and is a well accepted procedure worldwide. To summarize, I would say that uh, to many of the questions that we started off in, in early 20th century, we have found the answers, but new questions will keep popping up and will decide the course, uh, the progress of, of, progress of uh, spine surgery in future. We now know that there are 3D instrument, uh, 3D printing modalities, there are stereotactic instruments and so on and so forth. But the basic principles of science and uh, hard work will remain and we'll have to find answers for that in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Saurav, very much. It was a, a very comprehensive and nicely done presentation. You have uh, very nicely covered almost all aspects. Thanks very much. So, uh, uh, Dr. Lalit, are there any questions from... Uh, I'm not able to see the questions. We'll take yeah. the questions at the yeah. end. Okay, there are no fine. questions yet. There were okay. just some comments from the faculty coming in, so no questions. Okay, so next I would like to invite Dr. Birendra Balin. A uh, consultant spine surgeon in the industry to give his talk on basic biomechanics of spinal fixation. Thank you, Virinder. Please. Dr. Virinder, you are on mute.
Dr. Birinda, you are not audible. Uh, yes, there is a problem with the uh, microphone. No, sir, it's it's breaking a lot. Birinda, uh, uh, try to unmute yourself. Please unmute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, can you remove the uh, headphone and then try? Can you hear me now? Yes, clear. Sir. Okay, so I'll um, share the screen again. All okay? Perfect, sir. Okay, no, yeah, so fine. thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity um, to talk on the basic biomechanics. Um, and I'll try and take you through absolute basic stuff, uh, leaving the more specialized topics to um, the esteemed faculty coming later on. Um, so uh, all of you have probably used pedicle screws, whoever has done spine surgery. I don't think any surgeon in spine can... Um, not know how to uh, put in pedicle screws. And uh, I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with uh, at least the basic morphology of the pedicle um, and the variation in the pedicle width uh, with the different areas of the thoracic spine. And we have to probably dig deeper into the biomechanics to try and understand the use of these pedicle screws. Uh, so many technologies and techniques and instruments are designed which help um, in different situations, but it is a selection of the correct implant to the correct um, patient and to the correct circumstances that allows uh, a successful result. Um, and in order for us to do that, we need to be able to understand the bone biomechanics and the basic uh, mechanical properties of the instrumentations that we use. So bone is anisotropic, which means that the modulus of elasticity of bone is dependent upon the direction of loading of bone. Um, it is very strong in compression and is the weakest uh, in shear. Bone is also viscoelastic. Uh, its force deformation, deformation characteristics are dependent on the rate of loading. And I'm sure most of you who are orthopedic surgeons will know um, the, uh, the reason why um, the viscoelastic uh, elasticity actually um, presents with different um, uh, pathologies. For example, tear in an ACL as opposed to avulsion of an ACL which depends on the speed at which the bone is loaded. Uh, trabecular bone becomes very stiff in compression the faster it is loaded. And then we go across to materials, and materials have their familiar stress-strain curves. Uh, if you look at the elastic modulus, cobalt chrome and stainless steel is very high. Uh, titanium is roughly half of those, uh, and cortical bone um, uh, is uh, far less than titanium. And that is why we use titanium, because the modulus of elasticity for that as compared to other metals is closer to bone. Um, and it's also very important for us to understand that there are two modes of failure that we talk about. Quite often, um, the failure of an implant is um, inherently recorded as um, the same um, mode as failure of bone. We know that a bone fractures at a single load which is far in excess of what the bone can take at one point or one cycle. And we call it as a catastrophic load. And commonly, this is the mode that is reported in the implant literature as well. However, in life, most implants will fail by fatigue rather than by single external force. And the fatigue failure depends on the endurance limit of the material. Um, this is the common mode of failure of orthopedic implants and most of the pedicle screw fixation constructs that we have. Uh, the same is true ac across all um, uh, long bone fractures and short bone fractures that are fixed. So keeping those principles in mind, let, let's look at a pedicle screw characteristic. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what the head, the neck and the body, inner diameter, outer diameter, thread depth is. Um, and I'm not going to probably repeat that. But the two things worth noticing are uh, the characteristics called pitch, which is the distance between two threads, um, as long as you have only one thread. And then you have the difference between the outer and the inner diameter, 
And in the next few slides, the reason for those uh, will become clear. So this is true of any, ped, uh, any screw, whether it is used for long bones, whether it's used in the pedicle screw. If you want to increase the strength of the screw and resist fatigue failure, what you need to do is increase the core diameter. And the core diameter is the inner diameter that we talk about. So the bigger the core diameter, the stronger uh, and more fatigue resistance the screw will have. Um, and then you have not only solid screws, you have cantilated screws and cantilated screws, uh, you have an inner diameter and then you have an outer diameter. Um, the bigger the diameter, um, the better um, the fatigue resistance. Um, but in cantilated screws, you have to be careful when you choose your implant that the width of the thread, that is the difference between the outer diameter of the thread to the um, outer diameter of the inner core uh, is what will determine the purchase in, in the bone. Uh, the screw strength uh, is minimally affected um, despite the hollowness um, in the same way as, you know, there are debates about solid nail versus hollow nails uh, for long bone fractures. And then there are different pedicle screw types. Uh, sort of very nicely mentioned about the history of pedicle screws. Um, but now uh, we've gone away from monoaxial screws and we started using polyaxial screws. And then we've got different degrees of constraint that have been built into the polyaxiality. So you have uniplanar screws, which allow movement only in one plane. Uh, and then you have favored angle screws, which allow an extra movement in a particular direction, which are very useful at the end of constructs. So if you have a long construct finishing in C2 or finishing in the S2 Islec area, favored angle screws are really helpful. Otherwise, the poly mechanism can actually come off the shaft uh, because of the increased load. So the pull-out strength of pedicle screws. So there is one mode of failure is the pedicle screw breaking. The other mode of failure is the pedicle screw getting loose and coming out of the bone. And this pull-out strength of the pedicle screws uh, uh, depends on uh, the screw having a very large outer diameter, depending have, uh, depends on it having a very small inner diameter, depends on having a short pitch, therefore an increased thread density. It depends on the quality of bone. So if the bone is strong, then you'll have a good um, amount of cancellous trabecular bone in between the threads, which will increase the pull-out strength. Uh, and interestingly, uh, your tapping uh, um, before placing the pedicle screw will have an effect on the pull-out strength as well. Uh, the thread design of pedicle screws is different. Um, you have a single lead and you have a dual lead. Dual lead is like two threads going on at the same time. The biggest advantage of that is uh, that you, the number of turns that you have to give to the screw for it to penetrate a certain depth um, uh, is far greater. There is another concept called insertional torque. It's the resistance that you feel when you place the pedicle screw. And quite often, most surgeons will equate a high degree of insertional torque with the strength of purchase of the screw. Uh, but sadly, that is not true. Uh, the insertional torque is a tactile feedback uh, which is more closely related to the thread design rather than to the pull-out strength. So just because um, you have a good feeling when you place a pedicle screw doesn't actually mean that this pedicle screw will not come loose or will not break. I would urge all of you to look at look carefully at the design of the pedicle screws that you place in. And you may have to choose different designs on the basis of indications. Uh, there are various designs available on the market uh, depending on what proportion of um, uh, the length of a screw is occupied by different type of threads, uh, depending on the pitch, depending on the depth, um, and hopefully the next few slides will make it clearer. So before we have any further conversation about it, the two common uh, modes of failure are pedicle screws. So one is a situation where the pedicle screw just comes loose, all right, and that predominantly depends on the trajectory of the pedicle screw and the strength of bone. Uh, whereas failure of the metal, that is the breakage of the pedicle screw, usually happens in two common places. Um, and those places are either at the junction of the head and the neck or the transition between the neck and the rest of the uh, shaft uh, or the inner core diameter of the pedicle screw, or it happens right at the junction of where the pedicle ends uh, and the body starts. And this fatigue strength, uh, this is your endurance limit fatigue failure. 
uh, which depends on the inner diameter of the uh, pedicle screw. So the inner core is absolutely important. So you have, you have to make all possible efforts to make, um, uh, make that as wide as possible. So if you increase your inner diameter by 27%, uh, the fatigue strength increases by 100%. The neck is the weakest part. Um, uh, and even the coupling between the polyaxial head and the screw is another site of a uh, weakness. So there are various inner core design variations. You can have a perfectly cylindrical um, uh, shape of the inner core, or you may ha have a conical shape. The trouble with the conical shape is that, uh, like the Accutrax screws for a scaphoid fracture, once you put it in, it has a really, really good purchase. But as soon as you back it out by a certain amount, uh, it loses all purchase. Um, and therefore, most of the pedicle screws, um, the latest designs that you see are what we call as dual core designs. Um, so they have an inner diameter which is thickened around the neck of the pedicle screw and the part of the pedicle screw which is actually in the pedicle so that the fatigue strength of the screw is increased. Uh, but the part of the pedicle screw beyond the pedicle which is into the can, in the cancellous body, um, that is threaded cancellous um, bone feature um, and they are mostly double threaded to facilitate faster insertion. So choose a design on the basis of um, uh, the application. So just a brief word on technique. Um, I don't think we can talk about basic biomechanics and failure until the time we touch upon the technique a little bit. Um, it is well proven that if you keep the dorsal cortex intact, uh, it will help in increasing the stiffness of your pedicle bone construct. Uh, if you tap with the same size, it will reduce the pullout strength. Uh, whether you don't tap it or whether you under tap it by one, the pull-out strength is pretty much similar. Uh, tapping is really helpful to improve your trajectory of the pedicle screw so that the screw goes exactly where you want it to. Uh, do not manipulate the screws excessively and always preserve facet joint integrity. So the bone morphology also matters. It matters because the pedicle is actually the most important part in resisting the pull-out strength far more than the vertebral body. So about 60% of the pull-out strength of the screws comes from the pedicle itself. And the pedicle alone contributes to about 80% of the longitudinal stiffness. Um, you have to remember the pedicle screw does not gain purchase in the cortex of the pedicle. Because if you try to stuff the pedicle with the pedicle screw, um, the pedicle cortex will just deform. Um, so if the diameter of the pedicle screw is larger than the endosteal diameter of the pedicle, it will either fracture the pedicle or will cut out on one side, which significantly will weaken the construct and weaken the hold of the pedicle. So the pedicle screw has to be large enough, but not too large to damage the side walls of the pedicle. Trajectory is absolutely important. Um, for a single screw construct, if your pedicle screws are angled inwards by say 30, 30 degrees, the pullout strength is far greater. Uh, but for a longitudinal construct, even if all your screws are in a straight line, uh, it's actually been shown to be stronger than a multi-level convergent um, uh, trajectory. And then you also have a cortical trajectory that you can use, especially in osteoporotic bone, uh, which is as effective in osteoporotic bone as pedicle screws are in normal bone. The depth to which you insert the pedicle screw is important. Um, you should try and make all possible efforts to make the pedicle screws as parallel to the end plates as possible, as you can see in this example. Um, the screws that are most likely to fail are the screws that are angled more carefully towards the end plate. So keep it parallel or put it maybe cordially, it is better, rather than putting it carefully. The percentage penetration into the virtual body is important. So about an 80% penetration is about a third stronger compared to 50% penetration. There is no doubt that if you actually go bicortical and get a purchase in the anterior cortex of the virtual body, uh, it, it is the strongest. But then you do risk putting in longer screws and damaging the anterior uh, great vessels that are present. Crosslinks. Um, in large constructs, multi-segmental constructs, uh, the main use of a, uh, of a crosslink is to give some axial rotational stability. It does not help with the axial strength. 
Um, it does not help with the flexion extension strength or the bending strength. It helps to improve the rotational stability. And if you are trying to put in uh, cross links, put one in the middle and put one at the one eighth position at the proximal end of the longitudinal rods. And this combination has been shown to be the strongest for long uh, multi-segmented constructs. If you put a diagonal screw, uh, cross link, it is actually stronger than putting a than a, a transverse uh, cross link. And I think a cross link has a much better role in the following two circumstances. Number one, if you have a long construct with severe rotational deformity. And number two, if you have a short segment fixation where there is anterior column structural support problems, like in the case of a fracture or a discectomy or a corpectomy. So if you're doing a short segment fixation or one segment fixation for a lytic spondylolisthesis that you're reducing, uh, you should try and make all possible efforts to put in a cross link for that one level, uh, two level construct. Uh, so it depends on the pedicle morphology and integrity, as we have just talked about. It depends, the strength of a long construct depends on the number of screws that you've used, so the density of screws, um, the extent of your fixation from top to bottom, the trajectory of these pedicle screws. The strength also depends on the rods that you've used. So I've used a photograph here for an external fixator because the basic principles for strengthening an external fixator is exactly the same as the basic principles for strengthening a long uh, pedicle screw construct. So the material of the rods is important. A cobalt chrome is going to be stiffer than titanium. Different diameter rods, a 5.5 versus a 6 versus a 6.5 becomes important. And if you use too stiff a rod in something like scoliosis, then sometimes it can actually create more troubles for you than um, what you anticipated. So the diameter of rods is important. The number of rods, you would think that just one rod on each side is enough, but there are situations like if you're doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, where you may want to supplement more rods um, in order to prevent uh, troubles like rod breakage. Um, the type of screw connections, mono versus polyaxial, is important. Um, so you can use all the same orthopedic principles to improve the stability of a long construct. And then you have to think, um, okay. Um, a pedicle through construct is it the same as a tension band wiring of the spine, um, which is true in certain directions, but not true in others. Um, so tension band wiring is uh, on the eccentric side or the tension side of an eccentrically loaded bone. Um, so if you are flexing forward, then you are on the tension side to the posterior aspect. Uh, the bone is eccentrically loaded because uh, the anterior part of the body is compressed more than the posterior side of the body. So if you are flexing forward, it is like a tension band. But if you're standing neutral or going backwards, then it's, it is more like a neutralization device. Um, the stability of a construct that you build for a fracture fixation like this depends on how much anterior support you have. So if you have a two-part olecranon fracture uh, with two main parts, then a simple TBW will actually do the job. But if you have a multi-fragmented um, uh, fracture of the olecranon, then a tension band wiring will not do because there is not enough support in the cortical part. Uh, so just like that, if you have tremendous amount of comminution uh, in the anterior part of the vertebral column, then just a one segment above and one segment below is not going to hold and you will have deformity later on and you will have a fatigue of either the rods or the pedicles or the bone. Uh, and then we quite often think to ourselves, mm, why has my implant failed? Whereas um, um, we expected it not to. Uh, so bone and the human body is far stronger. The stresses on it are far stronger uh, than what any metal can take uh, beyond a year or two. So you will have failure in that time. So the gains load sharing index is absolutely essential. Uh, gives you a clue as to uh, constructs where you need to be long as opposed to being short. So you have to be careful, especially in osteoporotic bone and especially in cases like spinal metastasis where uh, the screw design, the screw trajectory, and augmenting the screws with uh, other fixation techniques like bone cement becomes very important. Just a couple of more slides on the basic biomechanics regarding interbody cages. Um, we all know uh, about the disc structure, um, then the end plate. The end plate has two parts, the hyaline part and the bony subchondral part. Uh, the subchondral part of the bony end plate is very important for the stability of any implant that you place um, in place of the disc. 
this peripheral strong rim of bone is strongest at the back and at the front. Um, but the whole of the bony end plate is weakest in the center. Uh, so you have to decide uh, where you want to place your cage, which approach you want to take, how much support do you want the cage to um, take. Um, and of course, it also depends on uh, whether the vertebral body, the cancellous bone above the or below the bony end plate being strong enough to take the excess loads. That will come when you place a cage which is straddling uh, the peripheral rim. So the quality of support from the vertebral body matters. But if that factor was neutralized, the strongest part of the end plate is the periphery. So your cage, which um, supports the peripheral rim, has a better chance of not subsiding compared to others. So the implant choice is really, really important. The surface area that is covered by the implant is really important because the center of the implant will give you space to achieve the bony fusion between the cancellous parts. The material of the cage is important um, because titanium cages as opposed to peak cages and the modulus of elasticity is completely different. Um, whether you wanted to share the load, whether you wanted to be predominantly load bearing. Uh, so you choose your implants according to the situation. Uh, the subsidence and union rates uh, will also depend on it. And nowadays, whenever I see patients where the cages have not united, um, I can see almost like failing hip where you have lucencies starting to develop in the uh, on the cup side or the femoral side. You can see similar lucencies developing in the virtual body. Uh, because of peak matter or uh, metallic uh, debris, uh, which the body, uh, the, the cancerous bone is trying to wall off. Um, so the union rate and subsidence rates absolutely depends on uh, not only your approach or the technique that you use, but also on the material of the cage, the type of support that you give. A wrongly done fusion has global spine consequences. Um, as you can see here, uh, this was a 43-year-old lady Somebody fused her in a wrong way, uh, and you can see the consequences. By the time she's 47, um, her whole uh, spinal um, balance is altered. Uh, so this basic biomechanical talk can go on and on and on. Um, I would like to end it here. Um, just to make you aware that even if you're doing a one or a two level fusion, please do not take it lightly. That The position that you fuse the bone in there can have long-term consequences for the patient. Because at the end of the day, everything depends on how many. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Virinder, so much. I know it was a very difficult lecture. And um, I thought that you're the best person to do justice to. So that's why <laughs> I persuaded you to undertake this. Thanks very much. And um, uh, you really done a comprehensive job. Uh, but the, it's, it's, it's indeed a very difficult topic to you know give a lecture on. Thanks very much for uh, being a part of this. And... Uh, so now I think uh, uh, there are think, a few uh, questions in the chat. Okay, let's take them. Just yeah. click, you can click the chat and uh, okay. there you can also so, have a yeah. look. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Birinda, would you like to? Um, yeah, I'll have a look. It has been, this is, so, Babuk says that. Um, it has been described the pedicle expand 200%. So many deformity surgeons advocate a larger screw. That is absolutely right. And I think a lot of, in a large segmental construct, you get away with it because your load is shared across so many different levels. I think if you look at the pullout strength of a pedicle screw, the more you deform a pedicle, uh, the less likely is it going to be strong enough in a single screw construct. Um, so, yes, you can, you can sort of expand the pedicle, but if you look at all biomechanical studies for a single screw pull-out strength, you definitely reduce it massively. Um, and but I but think, I, think I, I mean, it's true more for pediatric uh, pedicle screws rather than for adult uh, pedicle screws. That yeah, I was just about, to say, uh, just about to say the same thing, that you may expand the pedicle and the cortex may be lying on the outside of the pedicle and your pedicle is then protected by the screws above and below. And in six months' time, in a young person, the pedicle will reform and the cortex will reform. Um, and then you think, oh, yes, uh, this is a good technique and you'll get away with it. But try using that technique in something like a lytic spondylolisthesis where uh, you're just fixing L5 and S1. And I'm afraid uh, this technique will fail in that. 
Um, so I think the the long uh, nature, um, actually, uh, the long segment construct actually protects you. Um, Ashish says, why is the insertional talk not an indicator of the pullout strength? There was a paper that initially came out that actually indicated that, but every subsequent biomechanical article after that has said that um, insertional talk strength is not an indicator of pullout strength because the smaller pitch, uh, the smaller thread diameter or thread width of the pedicle screw, uh, the, ca the cancellous part of the pedicle screw um, in um, uh, is what determines the amount of bone between the, the different threads. Um, quite often, if you use the dual core screws where the thread width is not good enough, you somehow get a fantastic hold. Um, but the biomechanical studies all these days, at least in the last 10 years, are all showing that insertional torque is not the same as the pull-out strength. Um, what is... Uh, there's so much, sometimes you get away with lateral breaches in long segment deformity to sheer number of screws. Yeah, absolutely right, Saurabh. I agree with what you're saying. Roll and use of intermediate screws and cyclical load sharing in high combination fractures is pretty uh, widespread. Yes, it is pretty widespread, but you have to, uh, uh, you have to then decide um, how much strength will just one intermediate pedicle screw in that pedicle will give you. Um, I think it depends on the fracture configuration. If some part of the body is continuous with the pedicle still, and then you're putting a very small pedicle screw as an intermediate screw, uh, then things will be fine. Uh, but if the pedicle is discontinuous with the body, almost like those, uh, those osteoporotic fractures that you can sometimes see there, the intermediate screw doesn't actually do any uh, do much. So if you want one construct principle which helps you be successful and majority of the time, then I would urge you to look at the gains load sharing index and the degree of combination in the virtual body. Um, is there any other question that I missed? I think uh, we have answered most of them. And if there's anything, we can take it. I think uh, somebody asked about hubbing. Yeah, what do you, what do you mean by hubbing? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not sure what he's asking. I do not so, know what hubbing is. So hubbing is like, you know, when you... Uh, put your screw into the depth, you know, uh, when like you create a hub or you, you can say counter some sort of thing you do on the bone. Okay. okay. You directly. So it's called the hubbing. Okay. Yeah. I think you see, uh, I try to equate um, the use of a pedicle like use of a non-cemented stem in a femur. Right. So hubbing is something like that. You're trying to fill the pedicle with the maximum amount of metal uh, that you can get. And if that is the case, then you're trying to put your screw deeper and deeper and maybe a part of the poly uh, is actually sinking a little bit into the bone. So the more metal you put in there, the stronger it is going to be, which is fine. Um, and again, um, uh, whether uh, uh, whether you want to do that as a regular basis or whether you want to choose a pedicle screw design where the it's like a dual core where the neck and the part that stays in the pedicle is large enough, that's up to you to, to decide. If, say, for example, you have a six millimeter diameter and that gives you, say, a strength of 100, and then you have a seven millimeter diameter screw that gives you already a uh, raised to the power four um, increase in its bending strength, then by making it nine millimeters, you don't actually gain that much. Okay. And the hubbing then uh, may become a problem if you hub one area, but do not actually. Uh, then the, then the depth of your pedicle screw changes between one level and the other and the contouring of the rod may become slightly a problem. And sometimes when you are doing, say, adult lumbar deformity especially, uh, you put your screws in slightly deeper and you realize that by the time you put the rod in and by the time you put your reduction towers and stuff, uh, the screw that was the deepest has actually pulled out slightly already. So I think um, I would rather favor selecting a larger diameter in a core rather than actually putting in a deeper or having the pedicle screw. Fair enough. Okay, thanks, Parinder. So I think let's move on. And uh, I guess uh, you can stop sharing the screen now. And I think it's uh, my lecture now. Thanks, Parinder. Nice lecture. Cool. 
So whenever we are ready, I'm okay to share. Dr. Kamran, yes. please, please uh, turn on the uh, video. Yeah, I'm turned on. I think they have to stop share now. Um, so your screen is shared. No, I think it's the uh, makers of proxy ER who are sharing now. They have to stop sharing. Okay, let me do Okay, all right. Right, so are we ready to go? So uh, you're not visible to us. One second. It is clear, Dr. Kamran, uh, we can see your slides. Okay. Right? Okay, so yes, now we uh, coming to some basic topics, thoracic pedicle screw insertion. So I'll be focusing mainly on the technique or thoracic pedicle screws. So when we are putting any pedicle screws, uh, the most important considerations are the entry point. I mean, we have to get that absolutely right. If the entry point of the pedicle screw is not right, you can't get the pedicle screw uh, in the position that you would like it to be in. The second important uh, consideration from anatomic point of view would be the transverse pedicle diameter. Uh, actually, it is the width of the pedicle or the transverse pedicle diameter, which is a critical diameter. And by and large, throughout the thoracolumbar spine, if the uh, height of the pedicle or the sagittal, sagittal pedicle diameter is okay, it's actually the transverse pedicle diameter, which is the critical or the restricting diameter in increasing the size of the screw. Uh, then uh, you need to have an idea at what level you are instrumenting about the approximate transverse angle or the medial lateral angle of the pedicle, uh, as well as the sagittal pedicle and angle or the um, caudal cranial angle that you need to build in your trajectory, and as well as the approximate diameter of the screw. And obviously that will depend again on the transverse pedicle diameter. Uh, you should have an idea what size screw you are going to use at that level. And only then you can successfully put a thoracic pedicle screw. So when you look at the CT scan, I mean, nowadays we are getting CT scan for all the spine patients that we are operating upon. So it's always a good idea. So preoperatively have a look at the scan, at 3D CT scans. And what we need to look or focus on in the CT scan is on the transverse cut. We need to have an idea about the pedicle width or the transverse pedicle diameter, which is absolutely the critical diameter. And again, at the same time, you can have a look at the pedicle angle or the medial lateral trajectory of your screw, and at the same time, have an idea on the CT scan uh, about the approximate length of the screw that would be required at a particular level. Uh, on the sagittal cut, you can have a look at the pedicle height. Uh, like I told you before, pedicle height is not actually the crucial or the deciding uh, measurement when putting pedicle screws, uh, but at the same time, you can have a look at the sagittal pedicle angle, and it will give you an idea uh, about the approximate craniocortical and angulation that you need to build in your trajectory. So again, on the sagittal cut, you can have a look at the height and then see uh, whether the amount, the diameter of the screw you are going to put uh, will be, you know, uh, big enough or the height is big enough to take that screw. But uh, actually, and at the same time, have a look at the sagittal angle or the amount of craniocortical inclination that you are going to give to your pedicle instrumentation at that particular level. I mean, it will keep changing with what level you are instrumenting in. Uh, as you go down the thoracic spine, you might have to build, especially in the mid thoracic spine and upper thoracic spine, you have to angulate down more. And as you come down at D10, D11, 12 level, uh, the sagittal angle would nearly be flat, uh, zero. Uh, on the transverse cut, uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, the pedicle width is a crucial diameter which will decide the diameter of your screw that you can put at one level. So when you're having a look at the CT scan, always have a look at what is the diameter, uh, as well as a set transverse pedicle angle or the medial, medial lateral angulation that you have to build in your trajectory while putting screws at different level. And then again, this will also change uh, at different parts of the spine. So these are the things that you should keep in mind 
when you're looking at the CT scan or during the pre-op planning. So coming to the exposure in the thoracic spine, uh, even like in the lumbar spine, what you have to do is, you know, do a good subperiosteal exposure right out to the tips of transfer processes. Uh, you should be able to see the inferior uh, facet of the superior vertebra, uh, as well as the, you know, uh, as well as the superior articular process that will become visible once you take down the inferior facet, as well as the lamina and rectopar. So a good exposure is absolutely critical for you to get the anatomy right and get your entry points right. So a, a bit of anatomy in the thoracic spine. So uh, you have something called the, the transverse ridge on the superior part of transverse process. So that's a key deciding factor. The other thing to look at, uh, at is the superior facet. And this can be exposed only once you have taken down the inferior facet which or the superior vertebra, which is covering it. So especially in the mid thoracic spine, uh, where you have to, you know, go really high and medial, you have to take down the uh, the inferior facet of the superior vertebra to be able to uh, instrument the pedicle in the critically important and narrow diameters of the mid thoracic spine. Uh, and then you have to look at the lateral parts. They should be exposed nicely, as well as the whole of transverse process down out to the tips and transverse processes. So now uh, coming to entry points, uh, we need to keep in mind that as we go up or down from thoracic spine, the entry points would keep changing and you have to build in that subtle changes uh, uh, while taking the entry points as well as the trajectory. So for to begin with from the lower thoracic spine, the entry points are basically a bit more down, almost at the mid of transverse processes and more lateral. So keep in mind that in the lower thoracic spine, say T12, T11, and T10, the entry points are more lateral and more down, almost uh, more inferior, more caudal, almost at the mid of transverse process. And as you go up the thoracic spine towards the midpoint, middle of spine, these entry points keep shifting medially as well as superior. So keep this in mind. And then again, as you go even further, so in the mid thoracic spine, from the middle of transverse process and more laterally, the entry points keep shifting more medially and superiorly. So uh, once you are in to going towards the mid thoracic spine, say T9 to T5, the entry points will start shifting more medially. As you can see here, they're going medial and go superiorly. So they'll start shifting from middle of thoracic uh, transverse process at T12 to more towards the superior part of transverse process. So that you have to keep that in mind. And again, as you reach the upper thoracic spine, say from T4 to T1, the entry points again start shifting back inferiorly as well as lateral. So this is, so it's like a curve. Initially to begin with, when you're uh, instrumenting from D12 upwards, it's the entry points are more inferior and more lateral. And as you reach the middle thoracic spine, yeah, the entry point becomes slightly more medial and more superior. And then when you start reaching the, when you start reaching the upper thoracic, when you start reaching the upper thoracic spine, then the entry point, the starting point, again, moves inferiorly as well as lateral. So you're back to where you were at T1. So it's, it again comes back to transverse, middle of transverse process and almost at the junction of lateral part. So keep this in mind. Uh, this is important in thoracic spine, right? So as a general rule, what you can see is that if you if you divide the superior articular process of the instrument, of what you are to be instrumented into two halves, right? So as long as you are in lateral, in the lateral half of the superior articular facet with regard to medial, medial lateral entry point, you are safe, right? So always bear in mind that you should always keep on the lateral half of the superior articular process when you're instrumenting thoracic vertebra. That's part one, right? And from the medial lateral point of view, again, like I told you, when you are uh, lower down into the thoracic spine, say at uh, D11, D12, D11, D10, you are more caudal. And as you start going up towards uh, D9, 8, 7, and 6, you are going superiorly almost to the uh, or to the ridge or superior part of transverse process, then again, as you reach the proximal part of the spine, that is T1, 2, 3, you again start coming down, okay? So this is what you have to keep in mind. And as a basic rule, you divide the superior facet into half and always keep lateral to this 
and depending on the level you can be more lateral uh, when you're lower down and up in press or you could be more medial in the mid press so uh, uh, the screw hole preparation can be done with a bar right depending on the trajectory you are choosing or you can use the ronger so uh, the next thing once you have made the entry point the next thing is the trajectory so for trajectory you need two angulations which you have to keep subconsciously in your mind the medial lateral angulation or the transverse sagittal angle that we were talking about as well as the cranial quadrant angulation so with regard to cranial quadrant angulation in general you should keep in mind what level of the guide forces you are instrumenting it a good help is if you take a lateral view of the spine that you are instrumenting that will give you an idea of what uh the amount of kyphosis or the lordosis you have to build in uh while putting a trajectory with regard to the medial lateral angulation keep in mind that at t1 the angulation is high in the proximal thoracic spine at t1 t2 it is almost 22 to 25 degrees and it reduces by the time you come to t5 t6 and remains by and large the same uh say around 10 to 15 degrees or let's say uh, 10 to 15 degrees of medial angulation uh and it keep on decreasing as as you reach t12 so by the time you are at d11 t12 in fact at d12 it's divergent so you keep in mind uh this medial lateral angulation uh the setting at proximal thoracic spine is very high so uh, the medial the transverse pedicle angle uh at t1 is almost 25 to 30 degrees convergent so you have to angle in your screws that with more so as you come down to almost t4 t5 t at t4 it keeps reducing gradually from t1 to t4 to almost 30 to 15 degrees then from t5 till almost t8 9 uh it is constant uh, it keeps reducing from say 7 it's constant uh, between 7 and 15 degrees and then you as you come down from 9 to d12 it reduces even more and in fact at d12 the pedicles are divergent because the rib heads keep moving backwards right as you come to d to t12 from t1 so you have to keep that in mind so while instrumenting d12 you have to either be very straight or just uh, keep your entry point a bit more lateral and keep the medial angulation just about 10 to 15 degrees you cannot have it at 25 to 30 degrees medial angulation at d12 otherwise you will create a medial breach right the other thing is what kind of trajectory you are planning so there are two trajectories which are common one is the straight forward which is the blue lines as you can see on the left so in straight forward the entry points are more inferior and uh, medial lateral entry point is by and large the same it's just that you go straight and you take inferior entry points whereas on the on the right side in the green pins which you can see is the orthogonal or the anatomic trajectory so that's actually right in the center of the pedicle so as you can see the pedicles in the thoracic spine are sited a little bit high and they angle down if you see the axis of the pedicle it's actually higher up and it's angled down so an anatomic trajectory the screw would go from the top almost at start at the from the base of the superior facet and it will go down the orthogonal path of the pedicle into the lower part of the vertebral body whereas if you do a straight forward trajectory which is um, let's say more biomechanical superior you the entry point would be a bit lower and you would uh, aim the screw straight down parallel to the superior end plate and the reason is why we want to do a, a straight forward trajectory is because uh, the pull out strength is almost 30 for 4% 30% more in a straight forward trajectory the reason being that you have a good uh the quality of bone in the near the superior end plate is good as compared to the uh the vertebral body as such and you have 40% more uh insertional torque so we should aim for a straight forward tra trajectory however if you breach the straight forward trajectory you have a chance of putting the pedicle screw in a orthogonal or the anatomic trajectory so uh coming to the common freehand technique what we need i have already told you starting point or the or the entry point a screw trajectory and the interstitial feel, feel of the crack by the uh, by the ball tip that they are absolutely essential and these are the instruments so these are the starters i mean i'm sure everybody is familiar with it and these are the gear shift probes which are angled or you could have a straight one also and this is the ball tip uh, right so uh, first of all you have to create a dorsal cortical breach uh, you could do it with a burr or a ronger 
the only thing I would say is that do not develop too much bone, otherwise it will weaken the strength of your pedicle screw. The, um, the more amount of dorsal bone that you remove, uh, uh, the weaker your construct would be. So try to remove as much little bone as it necessary so that your starting uh, starter or the awl does not slip from the uh, dorsal cortex, right? Uh, you need to use the gear shift probe. Uh, if you're using the angled one, then you should point it laterally first for about 15 to 20 millimeters and then take it out and then point it medially into the vertebral bodies. Um, to, if you're beginning, uh, the good idea to just uh, go 15 to 20 meter, millimeter to start with and then check for the ball trope that you have not breathed the pedicle walls. And then you should shift the uh, uh, pedicle uh, uh, gear shift and then chain and go all the burn up, uh, up to the body. Uh, it's always imperative uh, to keep in mind that you should have a snug and smooth bony feel and there should not be any certain gateways. So that will give you an idea that you have breathed the pedicle crack. And always, always do a ball chip palpation of the whole track. Absolutely essential when you're putting therapeutic pedicle screws. Uh, you must have a bony feel right up to the vertebral body, anterior part of the vertebral body. Uh, you should be able to feel uh, the bony track. Right, and as we already talked about this, you should, while doing the exposure, you should expose all the way uh, out to the transverse process, that to border of parts, as well as the lamina, as well as the facet joint. So this is what your exposure should look like. Uh, you should be able to see the inferior facet of the superior, but if you're planning to instrument this level, uh, then you should have, uh, you should be able to look at the inferior facet. After that, uh, you should osteoptimize uh, the inferior facet of the superior vertebra. So once you have done that, uh, the osteotomy, uh, you can do the lateral cut first and then the vertical cut. You should be able to see the shining white cartilage of the superior facet of the vertebra to be instrumented. And then, then uh, as you can see here, the shiny cut. And then depending on the level that you are in, you can, you know, uh, uh, decide what is your entry point and then go on to uh, make the entry point. Uh, it's a you know if you if you want you can before making the final track you can put in a, a wire and check on the CM if you are starting out and you're not confident it's always idea good idea to take an EP and that review uh, for beginners uh, and once you have done that and you are okay then you can do you can make the pedicle dorsal cortical breach uh, with the starter and put the pedicle probe first point it out laterally go for about fifteen to twenty millimeters take it out. Uh, check with the ball probe and then uh, rotate it 180 degrees and so that it points medially and th then go all the way down and then look for, uh, check the whole track with the ball tip. Uh, it's essential that while, you know, this is the key step uh, to make sure that you are safe is to, uh, with the ball tip, uh, you should sound the whole pedicle track and the, 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 uh, you do it with two hands and you should always feel the medial lateral superior inferior wall as well as the floor before putting the pedicle screws. So, uh, uh, sorry. So, uh, you feel all the five tracks as well as the, uh, as well as the uh, floor. And uh, I'll just show you a short video. So, so if you're going to instrument this level, you have to take down the facet, inferior facet of the superior vertebra so that you can see the, uh, you can see the inferior facet a superior facet of the inferior vertebra, and then you decide on the width of that uh, superior facet. And then you can decide, uh, depending on the level, uh, where exactly you want to cite your entry point. Uh, you can create the dorsal breach, uh, either with a ronger or a bird, depending on what you find more comfortable, uh, comfortable. So then you see the width of the superior facet and make your entry point. Once you have done that, uh, Take the all and initially point it laterally, go for about 15 to 20 millimeter, which is actually the cord length of the pedicle so that you're not outside the pedicle and then check with the ball probe. And if you're happy, uh, shift the gear shift 180 degrees and go all the way down. And finally, uh, check with the ball probe again. If you want to tap, you can under tap with, with a 0.5 or one millimeter tap and then put the pedicle screws. Uh, Right. So as a final check on the C-arm, you can check once you're putting a screw for accuracy on the AP X-ray, uh, the screw tip 
should lie between the medial pedicle wall and imaginary midline of the vertebral body and on the lateral view if you have used a, a straightforward trajectory the screw should be parallel to the superior end plate and the anterior cortex should not be violated okay that's important because if you are, your screw is right at the uh, anterior part of the vertebral body and considering that it's a convex vertebral body, it is possible that even if it is touching and you're not angulated medially enough, it might be out anteriorly. Uh, if your medial wall is not crossed when you put the hole of the screw, then it is possible that you have a lateral out screw or if you have violated the imaginary mid midline, it is possible that your screw is medially cut out from the pedicles. So the take home message is that uh, obviously we all know that pedicle screw is the backbone of spinal instrumentation. Uh, it can be done in a safe and consistent way. Uh, you should make yourself familiar with the anatomy, especially the trajectories that how they change as you go down the thoracic spine, uh, the medial lateral angulation as well as the uh, cranial cordial angulation. It has a learning curve, but it is fairly safe. Thanks very much uh, for patient hearing. Okay, so I'm done. Are there any questions? What's that? So I think. Uh, Hello. You, you uh, Dr. Kamran, I think you can yes, tell about. Yes, how mute? No, I am not muted. Uh, so I think uh, you can. How can muted? Yeah. So I think you can also emphasize that the uh, we should not cut the uh, the facet for the the proximal most. Uh, your voice is still not coming. I think, uh, I think Kamran has not put on the microphone on his ears, so he can't listen. Okay, so next uh, is, uh, Bauk, we, uh, when we are sorted out, we can take the question later. So, Dr. Pankaj, you are next up. Are you there? Yes, sir. I'm very much there. Uh, should I start sharing my screen? Uh, Dr. Pa uh, yeah, okay. Pankaj, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Can is my voice audible? Yes, Doctor Pankaj. Uh, Doctor Kamran, you are not. Uh... I think there's some issue with the audio. I think it's at your end, uh, Professor Kamran. Let me call him. Uh, should I? Uh... Yeah, uh, Pankaj, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Audio issue. Pankaj, you have to share your screen. Okay, so yeah, Bhavuk is saying that yes, that is important that the how hello hello Dr. Farooq, are you able to hear hello? us? Hello. Is it okay now? Dr. Farooq, Dr. Dr. Farooq, are you able to hear us? Hello? Dr. Farooq, are you able to hear us? There is an audio issue at Kamran's end. So, Pankaj, why don't you share oh, that's your okay. screen? That's okay. I think uh, I put this uh, on this thing. Now I'm okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, while playing the video, I put this uh, mute here from my PC. That's okay. Fine. So, okay, yeah, yeah, that's very important. Actually, uh, what Bhavuk has said was, uh, especially at the proximal most level and the distal most level, we should try to, uh, we should have to make an effort to preserve the facet joint. Otherwise, you can land up in, uh, in a junctional kyphosis. That's very important. So, at the proximal ju junction, we have to make every effort to preserve the level as well as the distal junction. Yes, Pankaj, please go on. And uh, is my screen visible? Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Pankaj, you are audible. Uh, you are not visible, sir. Your screen is visible. Uh, you want me to switch on my video with my camera? Yeah, I think Pankaj, you yes, should sir. switch on your video because speaker video is important, right? Uh, once again, just give me some time then. I'm somehow not very well versed with Zoom and... Uh, just, just click on the video. Uh, go on the top and I think it will come. Or even so at the bottom of your left screen where it's mute, next to it is video. Just switch on the video. I'll stop sharing and then go. Yeah, yeah. So you might have received a uh, Start my video. Pop Should we do that? Okay. Yeah. That's okay now. 
Yeah, Pankaj, we saw you for a minute. That's okay. Just do it again. Looks better. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Fine. Yeah, okay, go on. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about lumbar pedicle screws, which I would say every beginner should start with and then move on to thoracic pedicle screw. The learning objective are going to be anatomical considerations. They could be, they, you, you can expect some repetitions, especially with the uh, with the Professor Kamran's talk. But I'll be taking you through the different techniques. Uh, I'll show you some videos, step-by-step -step freehand technique of putting, putting a pedicle screws. I may slightly touch upon the complications as well. So uh, pedicle screws, obviously we all know, uh, has revolutionized the way spine surgery is being done. For last uh, more than two or uh, three decades, pedicle screws are around. And uh, the accuracy uh, obviously have increased uh, tremendously with the improvement in the instrumentation and the technology we right now have. Yet we need to know that anatomical knowledge is the most important prerequisite before you attempt pedicle screw placement. This becomes all the more crucial if you are dealing with a deformity. Some of the basics of the morphometry, pedicle morphometry, which every beginner should be aware. And mind you, these all are usually done on a CT scan, which Dr. Kamran uh, enumerated before. Most important happens to be transverse pedicle width. Then is the transverse pedicle angle. This shows how medially is the, uh, is the axis of the pedicle on the axial cut. And then on sagittal, pedicle height is uh, crucial. And last is the sagittal pedicle angle, which is the angle or axis of the pedicle against the superior end plate of the vertebra. These are uh, studies from Western population where uh, they have shown that transverse pedicle width, width of uh, L1 is the sm smallest and it gradually increases to L uh, till L5. You have to keep that in mind. And uh, similarly, that if the transverse pedicle angle it is uh, very important, especially to avoid uh, the medial or the lateral breach of the pedicle. It increases gradually from cranial to caudal direction, just like the width. And uh, it could be zero degree at L1, and it can go up to 30 degrees in uh, at the at the L5 level. Now coming to sagittal pedicle angle, uh, L3 as L4 is usually zero degrees. Uh, it's a very horizontal kind of a pedicle in the sagittal plane. While you go up, it is usually directed uh, more rostrally or uh, capillate. While if you go down, uh, especially L5 and S1, uh, they are more caudally inclined. So these things are uh, these things have to be kept in mind. You have to ensure that the screws are usually parallel to the end plate. Now this is where I think the lumbar pedicle screw slightly differs from uh, thoracic pedicle screws that the uh, screw, uh, if you look at the cut section of the pedicle, uh, it is usually elliptical, which means that the height is more than the width. And then the, uh, the margin of error is more, especially if you want to revise uh, a pedicle screw, you have more uh, freedom of angulation in the sagittal plane, especially in lumbar pedicle screws. Mind you, all these uh, these uh, measurements are usually done on a CT scan, and uh, uh, preferably the scan should be uh, should be parallel to the end plate, which you call as pedicle oriented sections. This would give you the exact um, exact morphometry of the pedicle width of the pedicle. Otherwise, you may go wrong. So, having uh, if you look at this purple line, you see it is very perfect uh, parallel to the end plate, and this would give you a good picture of the of the vertebra on the axial section. There are plenty of studies uh, from Indian population on pedicle morphometry, and I'm I'm glad that few of the faculties are very much in the uh, in the panel here, and uh, this becomes important, especially for uh, for attempting pedicle screws fixation and uh, knowing how Indian population is different from the Westerns. We too had a uh, we had to had a study, especially with the. Adolescent deopathic scoliosis because deformities, uh, pedicles are slightly more difficult, challenging, and uh, uh, and 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 difficult to navigate. Coming on to step by step freehand technique, as Professor Kamran also said, uh, posterior standard midline incision and superiostal dissection. Dissection has to go as far as that uh, tip of process process. 
Now, once you have the uh, the facets and the process process in mind uh, in front of you, then comes the entry point. For lumbar pedicle screw, usually it is the midpoint of the TP, which is the horizontal uh, line, uh, which you have to remember. And uh, the vertical line is usually going through. It depends from which technique to technique. I'll go to the, uh, to, to it in the next slide. But uh, you can, uh, it could be just on the outer, outer aspect of the superior articular facet, which could be your entry point. This could be the entry point of lumbar pedicle screw. Many times you can come across with a mammillary process there and that would guide you for the entry point. So these are the three standard techniques of uh, or, uh, of uh, lumbar pedicle screws. Roy Camille technique, which is uh, where the entry is slightly more medial and the uh, trajectory is more vertical. So the, uh, if you look at this, the cord length of the pedicle screw is going to be shorter in Roy Camille, while if you go slightly lateral, which uh, Margaret uh, mentioned as nape of the neck. So you, uh, it's, it's, it's the junction of where the TP meets the superior articular process, which, which you call which he termed as nape of the neck. And then you can nicely angle it medially. You can get better angulation and a better cord length for your uh, pedicle screws. However, you just have to remember that all most of the screws, if you look at it, are, uh, are uh, it should be as parallel as possible to the superior end plate. And you go more lateral, that's a Winstein uh, method. <clears throat> this is more true, especially when, once you walk down. So if you have L5 vertebra, you have to have more angled pedicles and the entry, has to, entry point has to be more lateral. So once you have decided the, uh, the entry point, then comes how, how you want to make the pilot hole. You can use a, a drill. A drill can be used to make a pilot hole and you watch for the pedicle blush. Or uh, you can also nibble uh, with the help of a ronger, which I personally prefer, unless it is a, 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 it's, it's a difficult pedicle, especially if you are dealing with cervical pedicle screws or you go higher up at C1, C2. I usually prefer a uh, ronger. You have to keep one thing uh, absolutely in your mind while doing this is that you don't open the facet during dissection and you don't destabilize the facet, especially the rostral pedicle with the rostral pedicle screw. Now, once you have made the uh, pilot hole, then comes the gear shift probing, which uh, is usually a, you can see it, there is a giant gentle curve to the to the probe. And initially, for, no, for first 20 to 30 mm, you have to be directing it laterally. And once you have done that, we have gone beyond 20 to 20 mm, then you curve it 180 degrees and then go further inside. Mind you, with every 10 mm of, of your uh, um, all going in, you have to check your middle wall. That is the safest way of doing it. And for the beginners, there is no hesitancy in bringing the C-arm and checking the screws with every 10 mm. <clears throat> you have to check for the medial and inferior wall, especially uh, until you are uh, uh, in the pedicle. And once you are through the pedicle, then the floor becomes very important, especially lumbar spine. Remember, medial and inferior wall are very important. Uh, you may enjoy the nerve root or you may enjoy the dura medially. And once you go further down, you are, it's the floor and you have anterior big vessels in front of you. So just keep all those things in mind. You can uh, undersize your tap and, and, and uh, go ahead uh, with the same trajectory. Checking with the fluoroscopy is important. AP view is, uh, is AP and lateral view are important for, uh, for your directions. If there is no crossing of the medial pedicle wall, that means that you are mostly laterally out. And if you if you just draw imaginary midline, midline, and if your tip of the screw is going beyond it, that means you are most probably medially out. You have breached the medial wall. So these these are the, some of the tricks which you have to remember. Uh, and uh, if, uh, and uh, in lateral view, you need to show be sure that uh, that the screw is parallel to the end plate and. Uh, at least it is occupying up to 80% of the uh, length of the body. So that would be the ideal screw uh, in, in both images. For beginners, I think you can have your markers in place and uh, check the C-arm with every 10 mm. It, it definitely helps. So the standard positioning for the posterior uh, exposure 
you have to take care of the eye and other bony prominences, flexion of the knee. Recording stopped. Okay. Don't worry. Go on. Yeah. Fine. So, uh, so you have everything in mind. Just, just keep, keep one thing in mind that, that all the wires should be well uh, secured to the table, and uh, you should have an easy uh, access to the C arm while you are operating on the lumbar spine. The standard midline incision, as I said, and you go superior steel, and this white glistening thing which you see is the, uh, this is the facet, that's a facet. Then you have the trusses process, and third becomes the parse. These three structures are absolutely essential before you make the entry point. Then as usual, I took a ronger and uh, made an entry point at the nape, and there goes the pilot hole maker or the starter all. Check with the Baltic probe. There goes in the linkage all, which is laterally curved. And then gradually you curve it medially. Again, probe it. And then you put in the pedicle screw. I'll quickly go through the video also. This is the polyaxial screw. And if you can see, this is L2 vertebra. It's slightly cephalid uh, angled. It's, it is uh, rostral or cephalid uh, angled. So, Ankit, before yeah. you play the video, can you tell about the uh, the safety triangle uh, you know, for the benefit of you know the safety triangle uh, for putting the lumbar screws? Uh, I need to go back. That's okay. Go on. We I'll ask you later. Okay. So the standard posterior midline incision. I usually preserve the posterior midline structures, uh, the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, especially if you are not uh, going ahead with the laminectomy, this becomes very important and you're doing a T-lip, then you try to preserve them as much as possible. And going absolutely superior still so that there's not much bleeding. And this is uh, what we were just looking at. Uh, now you look at this, I'm trying to find the midpoint of the TP with the starter all and then I went in. You can check in under CM at this point uh, with experience. You, yes, you can definitely go ahead with your uh, linkage all. This is going in and uh, almost, uh, I'll go up to 40 mm here. <clears throat> Checking the walls again, all the four and five walls including the floor, and there goes the polyaxial pedicle screw. Same thing is, uh, is, is done on the other side, and then you are you're through with your instrumentation. Dr. Birender spoke uh, elaborately on the screw and everything, so again, uh, it should be ideally uh, engaging 70 to 80 percent of 50 to 80 or 70 to 80 percent of the length of the vertebral body. For a lumbar pedicle screw, uh, uh, the, the the diameters which I commonly use for lumbar pedicle screws in adult population would be 6.5. It can be 7.5 uh, if you go down, and especially L1 is definitely narrow, and sometimes you have to go down and and just use a 5.5 screw. The length could be uh, from 40 to 50 mm, uh, depending again on uh, on the pedicle morphometry and the angle. By which you have uh, you have inserted it. I think uh, some of the, one of the speakers is going to talk about the complications. I'm not going to, uh, but yes, you have to. Uh, the one thing which you have to be very careful about is the screw malposition. Uh, either you can be medial or it could be lateral. There are a lot of uh, classifications for that. So overall, if you look at the pearls for good fixation, the outer diameter of the screw determines the pullout strength. The inner diameter determines the fatigue, fatigue strength. So the bigger the screw, the better the uh, better the construct, better the uh, fixation. Dorsal cortex should not be violated. Screw on each side should converge as much as possible and should be of good length. So longer screw, convergent screw, bigger screws, they all add to the uh, to the strength of the construct. And uh, in the sagittal plane, the screw should be as parallel as possible to the to the end plate, it should be straight. 
rotational stability, which is uh, Dr. Balian very nicely spoke about how trusses connectors can be used for imp improving the rotational stability. So all in all, the, to conclude, knowing uh, the pedicle morphometry is good, is, 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 is the way I think you should start a spine surgery with. Having right instrumentation uh, and uh, right implant size is, 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 is crucial, is very important. Beware of the complications. You should know uh, the structures anterior to the body and uh, medial and inferior to the pedicle. Be ready with the salvage procedures in case you have a screw pull out or a blowout, pedicle blowout. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pankaj. Um, I think there are no questions just as yet. So, uh, I, 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 what I'm going to ask you is, Pankaj, uh, there's something called a triangle of safety for lumbar pedicle screws. Could you just uh, uh, dilate a bit on that? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, can you just repeat, uh, Dr. Kamran? Yeah, there's something called a triangle of safety for. Uh, I, hope, I hope you're not talking about uh, Cambin's triangle. No, 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 not trying. So if you, uh, there's something, if you uh, take down the, if you take down the, uh, uh, with the nibbler, uh, between the transverse process, superior facet and parts, there's something called triangle of safety, uh, which is safe enough to put the screws in. And so it's, some people also call, uh, well, uh, it's called the triangle of safety, just as, you know, um, something I thought I should be. About. Right. So thanks very much. Uh, so next up is Dr. Bhavuk. He's going to talk to us about uh, uh, the hooks, uh, which are very interesting topics since as we are now into the you know era of pedicle screws, uh, people who are not doing deformity surgery that much, they are not so aware of hooks. So it would be a good uh, uh, opener, you know, introduction to hooks, uh, 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 you know, for spine surgeons because most of the guys are using uh, pedicle screws nowadays are not that familiar with hooks, especially the new generation. So it would be a good idea to have a lecture on um, hooks and spines. So Bhavok. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamran. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about the uh, spine surgery, uh, you can always apply the analogy of uh, girlfriends and wife to the uh, pedicle screws and hooks. And you can also see that why the flamboyant guys, they talk about pedicle screws and the hooks, uh, they are talk they are given to me. So actually, you know, uh, the pedicle screws, they work um, the, the most of the scenarios, but actually, you know, uh, when you are stuck and when nothing is working, then the hooks, uh, they are the, the salvage ones. And the, the, there is a sheer one point, you know, which always comes very important because there is only one pedicle uh, on each side to put the screws, but hooks, there are multiple sites, you know, uh, around, a, around a particular segment that you can put your hooks and they can always, uh, uh, you know, save you from, from that particular section. So the hooks, uh, actually, if you look at the history, the the hooks, uh, they were the part of the Harrington as well as the Harry Luke system. Uh, so uh, the, the concept of hook application in spine is is very uh, old vis-a-vis um, -vis the pedicle screws. And this was the first uh, quarterly debo system. And again, the hooks were the very important part of uh, this thing. And in fact, you know, the uh, many of the uh, deformity surgeons still today, they are using the hybrid construct because they believe that the thoracic pedicle screws, uh, they are not safer. And they have shown that the uh, many studies are there. Uh, they have shown that the, uh, the result of a hybrid construct is almost same as compared to uh, 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 all pedicle screw construct. So this is the, the usual uh, hook which we use. So these are, you know, the standard hooks. Uh, these are, you know, if, if there is a notch there, uh, like uh, uh, if there is a notch, then we call it as a pedicle screw. And if otherwise they all uh, can be used as the laminar screws or the, uh, or the transverse process hook. The important thing is that this area, which is the C-shaped area, it is, we call it as the throat size. And they come, these hooks, they come in different sizes. And also, you know, if we look at the uh, this hook uh, relation with the vis-a-vis -vis to the part which captures the rod. So we have the offset uh, hooks also available. So when the, uh, you can, you know, uh, put it as, um, you know, as the deformity correction requires in a particular case. So if you look at the hooks in the spine, you can use it for the pedicle, you can use it in the transverse process, you can use it them on the ribs and in the lamina one, again, you can put it on the, on the superior aspect of the lamina or you can put it on the on the, um, the inferior or the distal part of the lamina as well. 
coming to the particular hooks usually we use them between t1 to t10 uh, below uh, at t11 and t12 they are not useful because of the orientation of the facet uh, you have to remove uh, you can remove a partial removal of you know the inferior articular facet because then you can easily see uh, some i usually don't do it because i i don't think it is required uh, and then there is a frequent you can also remove the cartilage so that there is a fusion uh, you know the bed is prepared and uh, you can always use the combination of the the different hooks which we will just discuss uh, in the further slides so this is a typical pedicular screws you can see that there is a notch at the end and where the pedicle actually uh, sits um, uh, on this so these are the the steps you know these are the standard ao um, the, the teachings you take out the inferior facet and then you put your uh, pedicle hook maker you feel the pedicle and i always you know feel the pedicle and then i rock it medial and lateral and i just make the space and then you just put your uh, the pedicular uh, hooks so this is a video you can see here uh, this was a case of myelomeningocele uh, and you can see uh, uh, that i am putting this uh, pedicle hook maker into the facet joint and then i just feel the pedicle and we just uh, uh, you know it's very simple to apply and then you just uh, put your uh, hook into the into that thing the important thing is that you have to avoid any medial uh, direction of the of the uh, of the particular hook otherwise you may enter into the canal and then it can lead to the damage to the uh, neurovascular st neural structures so this is uh, just an uh, just a diagrammatic representation so if you miss the pedicle then you know uh, you may be in trouble and you can injure the uh, the neural structures coming to the transverse hook placement the transverse hook placement again you can apply either either from the above or you can uh, apply from the below and again you make you know space with the help of a of a hook maker and then you just seat your uh, transverse process uh, hook on that thing so just to show you uh, this thing uh, so this is like we have exposed we are putting particular screws and and you can see now that i will be putting uh, i will be using i am using a transverse hook maker above the transverse process to make space for the hook and then we apply uh, the uh, the hook so this is very uh, uh, simple to apply as compared to the uh, to the pedicle screws coming to the laminar hooks uh, i am not a big fan of uh, laminar hooks and i don't use them frequently because i am always worried because i am putting something uh, of a significant Put size into the canal, uh, so I may I do use them temporarily for achieving specific purposes, which we will discuss uh, later on. But usually, I don't uh, uh, use them in my practice. But again, you know, they are one of the uh, tools in your arm armamentarium, so they are frequently used in the thoracolumbar spine and even also in cervical spine. Uh, you make a space between the ligamentum flavum and the under surface of the lamina, and then you choose the appropriate throat size depending upon the age of the the patient and the size of the vertebra, and then you uh, you put these things. Uh, same thing is about the supralaminar uh, uh, hooks. This is just to show you that you make a uh, laminotomy. You uh, again with the help of the hook maker, you make the space, and then you apply the hook uh, onto that thing. again one has to be very careful that if you are not uh, careful then you can again uh, injure the neurovascular the neural structures either the root or the uh, the cord itself uh, if you are not careful you know where your hook is going this thing coming to the another entity called the claw construct so it is a combination of hook you know so uh, that goes up and one that goes down and uh, we divide them basically into a direct claw construct and an indirect claw construct so if you are spanning more than one level we call it as a indirect claw construct so you can either combine the infra and the supra supra laminar hooks at one level or you can use a pedicular hook and the transverse uh, process hooks at the adjacent level so this is just to show you an example that how you can combine the uh, the hooks in this configuration and then you can make a claw uh this thing so uh, uh so if there is um, uh, so this one on the on the left you can see that there is um, uh, more than uh, uh, is spanning more than one level so it is an indirect lock construct now coming to the indications of uh, hook uh, i will be sharing my experience uh, as such the indications they are not so well defined in the literature but i will be sharing what are the indications of using hook in my practice so as you know we uh, disc we, had, we were just discussing that you know uh, if we talk about the the uh, the what are the surgical strategies to overcome the biomechanical risk of developing pjk in in patients undergoing posterior spinal fusion for scoliosis so there are different strategies and people have uh, 
device this thing so one of the important strategy remains that the use of transverse process hooks at the uiv uh, the upper instrumented vertebra instead of the screw so again this is a very very important and this remains the number one indication of using hook in my practice so this is just to show you that this is this is a kyphosis uh, case uh, and there is a scoliosis as well and uh, i usually when there is a kyphotic deformity i use also the only the transverse process uh, hooks uh, at the top so you know there is a you know it is it is give me a soft landing at the top and also you know it gives me a, uh, a sort of you know uh, the 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 claw effect of uh, the holding the kyphosis and uh, this is just another example you can see that i'm using this thing and you can clearly see that how these transverse process they are you know resting against the uh, the, the the bone and this is the uh, the outcome uh, they are also very useful you know when you have to achieve some sort of final fine tuning of the correction like this is a case of ang spond with severe deformity so when i corrected this deformity you know with just the the the, the short uh, the, this thing the pso uh, posterior column osteotomies so then i realized that you know a little bit of uh, shoulder balance is this thing so i put a hook there and i just you know use this thing because the everything was fused so it is better to uh, it was a better option to use um, the hook on this thing and then i could get a uh, a good coronal balance as well uh, in this in this patient coming to scoliosis in scoliosis my configuration of hooks a little bit a little bit you know is different uh, so in kyphotic spine i use the both the both side the transverse process hooks while in um, um, in the scoliosis case on the convex side i use a transverse process hook uh, and on the concave side i use a pedicular hook so it gives me a distraction sort of thing on the on the on the concave side and it also helps me so you can see that you know i have formed a sort of indirect claw at the top which gives me all the advantages of using hooks at the at the top so this is my usual construct and i always use a transverse process i always use a transverse connector between these thing so this is the you know um, uh, this thing this also gives me rotational stability because which, which is of major concern with when we use recording in progress so like this is an, another case of uh, of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and you can see that there is a significant rotation uh, going on i'm not going to detail but again you know in this thing again i use the uh, these hooks to, to get the fine tuning to get a uh, optimal you know the the shoulder as well as the the t1 tilt there are some certain scenarios when there is a kyphosis and there is a scoliosis as well so when there both the entities are there then i always always give preference to kyphosis first and in these uh, those cases i always use only the 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 transverse process hook at the top and uh, i don't go for the uh, the pedicular screw hook uh, in these cases because the, the this this biomechanical stability is much more with this so one of the another indication in my practice is uh, you know i always use whenever i am using the growth rods i use the hybrid construct so various biomechanical studies as well as the clinical studies they have shown that if you use a hybrid construct in in with growth rods so again this gives you a, a better control the another important thing is uh, is a phenomena called auto fusion in pediatric uh, age group so i want to put at least five anchors at the top so uh, by using hooks uh, again you know it helps me uh, exposing the bone and it gives me a, a construct without exposing the bone so the auto fusion is less and the, like this you can see here and i always always put the, these uh, you know the 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 screws in distraction mode because we know that we are going to distract the growth rods and when we apply distraction uh, forces on the spine it's a kyphogenic it becomes a kyphogenic construct and again it becomes very important to uh, use the potential of the hooks uh, biomechanically in these uh, in these uh, cases this is again another case of uh, of using the the uh, the early onset scoliosis very severe case and again in this we have so this is a different technique uh, we have used the active apex control in this with the help of the magnetic rod and again we are using the the hooks you can see i have put them into the distract uh, the distraction mode uh, using the particular uh, uh one of the favorite um, uh, you know the 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 use of of using hooks is again the, um, the indian indianized version of uh, using the vector we don't have the vector in india so we use uh, this uh, these uh, you know the hooks to make uh, you know in, when there is a thoracic um, uh, deformities and the rib deformities are there so you can use the hooks over the ribs and then you can distract and you can increase the thoracic capacity uh, which is specially seen in thoracic insufficiency uh, syndromes another uh, use of uh, these hooks in my practice is uh, like uh, the uh, lenke group has described uh, 
they use the central hook rod construct for osteotomy closure. So, like you can see here, that there is a big uh, osteotomy defect. So, they have used uh, these uh, hooks, uh, you know, at the the upper and the the the, the bottom area of the osteotomy, and then they use. Um, a rod over which they close the osteotomy. Now, this is very important when we are correcting the large deformities. So, if you use your particular um, uh, screws to correct these sort of deformities, then these particular screws, they sometimes they pull out, especially, you know, when we're talking about the osteoporotic spine. So, the whole of the, and the lamina is actually a very stronger uh, area in osteoporosis. So, you can get, you know, the closure of the osteotomy without putting additional strains on the, on the pedicles. So, actually, uh, these authors, they have, uh, they leave uh, the central rod, uh, you know, this, the hook rod construct in situ. I, I, if I'm using it intraoperatively, I just use it temporarily and I take it out. And I will show you that how do I balance. So this is like, uh, you can see that it is a very severe case of um, ankylosing spondylitis with very severe deformity. So again, you know, when we are achieving these sort of deformity corrections and you use all your forces on your particular screws, then they are going to pull out and then you may lose your, uh, the, the correction as well as your, you know, it becomes a problematic. So you can see here in this case, like, you know, we have achieved a very significant correction at the, at the I've done two level VCR in this. So if you can see it at the L4, so I, we use this central hook rod construct um, along with other maneuvers, and then I replace them with these, uh, these, these small rods, what we call as a satellite rods. So you can see, actually, if you look at the osteotomy side, I am using at least six screws across this, six rods across this osteotomy side. So this gives the additional stability as well as the, the fixation, and it is a good method to achieve uh, the solid fixation without putting any additional strain on the on the pedicle screws and again the bone quality is very important in the angst point because the uh, because of the associated osteoporosis this is the correction so and the hooks they become very useful when nothing is working out you are not able to make sure that what is to be done uh, how should i salvage and hooks they always come very handy uh, like this is a case of uh, neurofibromatosis you can see here that uh, there are big neurofibromas and there is nothing you know the pedicle screws you cannot put pedicle screws uh, there is a dural ectasia as well and so in these cases, again, you know, uh, this is was a case of kyphosis. This patient presented to us with, you know, the, uh, the spasticity. And so we use these uh, hooks. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the hook of pedicle screw. And I also use the sublaminar wires in this sort of cases. So again, you know, you have to be aware of all the armamentarium which you have that you can use uh, in these uh, difficult cases. Another case of, uh, of a very uh, severe neurofibromatosis. You can see here, uh, the, the, there is a no place to put, you know, the um, the, um, uh, the particular screws in these cases. And again, I've used a hybrid construct. You can see here that in this area, I've used only the screws, uh, only the hooks, and I could get a good outcome uh, in this patient. Now, this is again a very severe case of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of congenital scoliosis. And you can, you can uh, unfortunately, I don't have the CT cuts with me right now, but you see in these cases when there's a big ped, uh, rib hump, so what happens that, you know, the ribs, they cover the entry point of your, your uh, pedicular screws. So what happens that the only uh, way you can put pedicular screws here is like you cut the ribs, you do a thoracotomy, and then you uh, you find your particular screw entry point. So in these cases, again, you know, these hooks, they come very handy and they are very useful and you can apply them over the ribs and whatever the points you find, and then you can achieve uh, a, really, uh, a good outcome in these sort of patients with the uh, help of the hooks uh, only. Uh, this is one other indication which I could found in the literature that people are using them for uh, spondylysis repair. Uh, it's like a modification of the box repair. They use these uh, particular uh, screws and then they on the on the lower infralaminar side, they put these hooks and then they just span it. So I have no experience of using it, but again, just for the completion of sake, I put it uh, in, in this slide. Uh, the complications, they are usually, you know, uh, rare uh, with the hooks. Uh, the only problems which we have seen in practice is the hook dislodgements. Uh, and when they occur, they are mostly, you know, just asymptomatic. The, the, the patient just complained of that. Uh, you know, uh, this thing is there, but sometimes we have to go and we have to revise them as well. So to say, uh, come, uh, to summarize the, uh, the hooks, they are very versatile tool uh, and to be, they always be, you know, they always be kept on your table if you are a deformity surgeon and uh, laminar hooks, they can be useful, especially if people, uh, uh, they are using the, uh, dealing with osteoporosis. Now we have fenestrated screws. So again, um, I don't use them in my practice, but I always keep them on my table. Thank Thanks, Babu. Very exhaustive presentation. Actually, nowadays, people have lost the art of using hooks. Earlier, I mean, when we were being trained, uh, people, uh, the pedicle screws had not come. So, 
I mean, in '95 and all, '95 onwards, everybody was using uh, hooks only. Pedicle shoes became popular later on. So people have lost the art of using them. Very exhaustive and nice presentation. Thanks very much. Um, are there any questions uh, on the chat box? Especially use of laminar hooks and so. Yeah, so if there are anything else, then we can take it later. So next, uh, I invite Dr. Abhishek Kashyap uh, to talk about sacro-pelvic uh, 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 instrumentation. Abhishek? Yes, sir. I think I'm visible, sir. That's yeah, fine. Go on. I will be speaking about sacro-pelvic fixation. I thank DUA for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts on how to go about sacro-pelvic You are you part of the executive. You have yes. to thank yourself. I said you are part of DUA, you are DUA only. <laughs> you have to thank yourself. Thanks, Dr. Kamran, for giving me that opportunity. So, I will be speaking about sacro-pelvic uh, fixation. <laughs> So my uh, talk is going to be mainly concentrating how to go about these modalities, touching on anatomy and biomechanics. Uh, biomechanics mostly has been uh, spoken by Dr. Birain. I'll be touching biomechanics, which is more pertinent to sacrophilic fixation. I'll speak about a little bit about how to go about it, complication, and where we need to do unorthodox fixation techniques. So sacral fixations have uh, uh, evolved uh, from 1960s. Before this era, uh, uh, pseudoarthrosis rate at uh, the L5-S1 region was very high. It reached about somewhere around 50%. Then instrumentation came in with Harrington rods and ILR hook, uh, the LR hooks. And still the uh, pseudoarthrosis rate was still around 40 to uh, 40%. Then something new came in, which is was the Gavelston Luke rod system, which was extension from the uh, neuromuscular sclerosis. Uh, it drastically brought down the level, but it's a difficult technique to perform. The main workhorse is now the sacral screws, the iliac screws, and the S2 AI screw, which is a new kid on the block. So coming to the anatomical consideration, if you see the sacrum in the cross section, it is not a true pedicle what you have. It does not have the boundaries, it is basically a confluence of the cancellous bone. And mainly the bone density is mainly concentrated mainly in the body as compared to the alar. So you tend to have uh, the sacral screws uh, medially directed and usually towards the sacral uh, promontory. Uh, since we were aiming for a bicortical or a tricortical purchase, so the uh, people should remember that anterior what is there in the uh, sacrum and these structures would be always at risk when you are going for a bicortical or a tricortical purchase. Uh, the safe zones have been defined anterior to the S1 body in the middle part. Uh, there is just a small, uh, the middle, uh, the middle uh, sacral artery which is a small remnant. And mainly you have a large area which is available in the S1 region, which is in the central part. The alar screws which are there in the S1 uh, have a very high uh, rate of penetration of the neurovascular structure. In a study Mirkovic, uh, done by Mirkovic in cadaveric study, he found that 50%, uh, more than 50% screws usually abutted the lumbosacral trunk and 8% uh, usually used to cause some damage to the internal iliac vein also. Coming to the biomechanics, which is pertinent to the uh, this region, uh, it's an article which is by uh, it's a, uh, a study by McCord. He described a lumbosacral pivot, which is uh, in the middle of the osteos, the osteoligamentous complex, and it is usually the axis at which the mainly the motion will happen. So they have defined that when the uh, implant crosses beyond anterior to this pelvic pivot point, the implant at the lower end would usually be stable in flexion and further you go ahead uh, when you do a pelvic fixation it usually goes beyond and you need to use larger screws to go beyond this point so uh, they are usually stable. Uh, 
coming to the sacropelvic uh, fixation, they have been defined further uh, on the basis of uh, the uh, bone density. O'Brien has defined it, the sacropelvic fixation uh, in three zones of concept. The first zone is the S1 and the S1 LR, uh, the ala. The zone 2 is something uh, which is below the uh, sacral foramen and it has a very poor density. The zone 3 is the highest of all the zones which has the highest bone density and provides uh, highest biomechanical strength to pedicle screws. And this point is usually too anterior of the pivot point. So it is usually they prevent uh, failure of the uh, lumbar sacral fixation. Uh, these, uh, uh, the transsacral bar was uh, advocated by Bostic. Uh, it is in a, it is usually of a historical importance, but it it sometimes may be used when you are doing uh, constructions in uh, tumor resections, uh, and uh, so they are of historical importance. But they might be used when you are needing an unorthodox uh, fixation. So I'm just uh, touching upon it. You basically put a rod into the iliac uh, wings, and you basically connect a rod, and you use the connectors to connect the topmost uh, rods. Uh, to the fixation. Uh, the first uh, fixation which went to the pelvis was described by Gavilston uh, and it was extension from the neuromuscular scoliosis. Uh, people who have uh, been, I have not uh, used Gavilston myself, but people who have been using Gavilston, uh, it's very difficult to get because you need a separate incision of a paraspinal area and you need to attach a long uh, rod and uh, it is uh, difficult and it is time consuming. Uh, they have shown that in spite of loosening uh, the windshield, uh, loosening, they had uh, good fusion rates uh, with L5 S1 uh, areas whenever these new rods were used. Uh, the coming to the main workhorse, the main workhorse are the sacral uh, screws, the S1 screws. Uh, they are the basic fixation of L5 S1. Uh, uh, they are used mainly uh, in routine uh, fixations. Uh, you aim to have a bicortical purchase. A bicortical purchase would be somewhere from here to the uh, sacral region. But once you have an uh, osteoporotic bone, you will try to aim for a tricortical purchase and you try to pierce the superior end plate also. Uh, there are two techniques which are advocated when you are using an S1 screw. Uh, the most common is that you expose the uh, facet joint and you go two uh, millimeter below the facet joint. Uh, the entry point is. I do not personally prefer to use this. I prefer to use do an osteotomy, see the facet joint uh, completely. First of all, it decreases the lateral exposure, uh, and secondly, it lets me uh, have a wider uh, bone density which is available to uh, put the screws. Uh, you use a lateral fluoroscopy to advance your uh, uh, probe and you try uh, to come to the uh, somewhere around the sacral promontory. Now, you do not try to pierce the sacral promontory. You tend to use a screw which is usually 5 mm greater than the probe when you are using and it will give you and it will purchase and give you a good tricortical purchase uh, for the screw. So these are the two techniques which are there. One I have already talked about, but this comparing the two techniques, uh, the classical technique where you go just two centimeter, uh, the two mm lateral and inferior to the facet joint, it usually requires a more lateral exposure and the most uh, soft tissue traction is required as compared to when you do an osteotomy. Uh, uh, it also gives me a more cortical thickness uh, and the, uh, when I'm using and the uh, facet uh, spurs and the uh, degenerative facet can be adequate uh, fixation to put these screws. The complications with S1 screws are known even with best of uh, best fixation, even when you are not using an anterior uh, support, uh, the screw breakage has been reported in literature about 15 to 20 percent. Loosening has been reported uh, with. Uh, when you have suboptimal purchase in the S1 region, malposition is reported and it has been reported to cause sciatica also. Uh, if you do not have an adequate, uh, medially directed trajectory for the S1 screws. The S1 alloy screws, I personally do not use these screws. Uh, you should avoid uh, using.
using these tools. They may be used uh, as salvage techniques when you are doing tumor reconstruction, when you have uh, sacrif uh, you have almost sacrificed the S1 body. Uh, the French have described uh, using this technique with a chopping block. Uh, it's a plate where you put a S1, normal S1 screw and you use uh, uh, the other screw as a LR screw. Uh, this is not available in India. Uh, I've seen uh, during my fellowship years, uh, a lot of German guys using this chopping block for spondylolisthesis. Now coming towards uh, pelvic fixation. Now there are since there is very high rate of uh, your S1 screws even in best of hands, uh, you need to progress. You need to transit towards a pelvic fixation whenever you are contemplating long fusion. You are contemplating high grade spondylolisthesis. You are doing deformity corrections. You are doing. You have uh, fractures in the sacral or the sacropelvic fractures are there. Or whenever there is some osteoporosis, you expect that osteoporosis and you need more fixation points in the pelvis. In spite of all the concerns which are there, uh, the fusion across an SI joint and many anatomic studies, even by uh, White and Punjabi, they have reported in cadaveric that even in cadaver there is minimal motion which is available. Around 50 years of uh, age, these usually the SI joint is usually fused, fused, and usually there is usually they do not have any motion around it. So the, it's a mainly a concern, which is an hypothetical statement. Yes, you may avoid uh, when you are using screws in childbearing age group uh, females because uh, uh, there the pelvic ligaments might not relax when you are using these. So. Uh, uh, these uh, screws when you are going across pelvic fixation. Uh, you may prefer to use the uh, iliac screws uh, as compared to the S2 AI screws. Uh, so it should be considered when you are thinking about childbearing age with females. Uh, with sacro-pelvic fixation, yes, the pseudo-arthrosis rate dropped down uh, drastically to 4-5%. to This is a retrospective study done by Kim uh, and from Lenke where they showed that uh, with the sacrophilic fixation, the pseudo-arthrosis dropped down 4 to 5%. Now, how do you go about doing using iliac screws? The iliac screws basically are done in the zone 3. You do a lateral exposure, you feel the iliac press. There are two methods where, uh, uh, for this also. One is where you do an osteotomy and you basically uh, see the two tapes and uh, you uh, the lateral and the, uh, the outer and the uh, internal tab, uh, tab of the pelvis and you basically go down uh, the trajectory pointing towards the ASIS. Uh, the iliac screw is basically, uh, if people who have been doing it, uh, usually require, it requires a connector. Uh, some people say that you go to an, uh, below the crestal area uh, uh, to use these screws where you might uh, with a lateral entry, you might be able to connect your rod with a uh, lateral tilt uh, by getting a more offset. Uh, personally, being using these screws and uh, it's actually difficult even with a connector on, you may spend a lot of time when you need to connect your rods when you're using iliac screws. The main complication with iliac screws is the prominence. Uh, this is a retrospective study by uh, Tushisha. Uh, where this showed that even with uh, screws, they had to remove uh, screws even uh, even in spite of good results, they had problems were because of the prominence and they usually used to cause impingement. So they had to remove a large amount of screws. Uh, overall, even with removal of screws, the, the overall rate of fixation or uh, the fusion rates were still high. So it's a good technique uh, which cannot go out of work. Uh, its uh, percentage uh, of iliac screw removal is very high. Personally, I have uh, uh, done a quite a few and I have removed a quite a few even after fusion. Now, something which has come to in vogue is the, as the S2 LAR iliac screw. It's a new kit on the block. They were advocate, they were first propagated by Kebishia. Uh, it's an S2 screw going through the SI joints pointing toward the anterior inferior iliac spine. 
and mechanically they are similar to the LAX screws. Uh, coming to the trajectory, you basically uh, see both the S1 and the S2 foramen, and you basically go lateral and inferior to the S1 foramen, pointing towards the ASIS, uh, and you basically uh, it's a 20 degree quarterly directed trajectory. Uh, the starting point for me personally is not the uh, going. Uh, through the foramen, I basically try expose the both foramens and I try that my screw is in line with the S1 or uh, the S1 and the L4 uh, pedicle screw. Uh, for me, I use that as mainly as my entry point. Uh, the most important thing is uh, how do you get your tilt of your CM to point these screws? You need to have these screws, they have to be just above the radar shaft and not where the important structures are lying. So you basically see in the AP fluoroscopy that you are basically above the uh, the SI or uh, the uh, above the radar shaft and not. The other important view is that you tilt your uh, gantry of your tube 20 to 30 degree Keflar and toward and 40 to 50 degrees in line with the, uh, the pelvic. Uh, 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 the pelvic, uh, the, the ilium, and you basically go down the trajectory. It's a gun, it's a like a gun barrel technique where you expose, you have a teardrop which is available, and you try to aim in the middle of the uh, uh, teardrop. The S2 Eliad screws they have minimal offset from the S1 screws, as I pointed out. You don't use need to use connectors, they are less prominent. There is no significant difference in the biomechanical properties in the S2 AI and the LAX group. Retrospectively, reports have come out now coming in which have shown that there are lower rates of reoperation. There is less surgical site infection because you spend less time. Uh, I have putting LAX screws. I spend an hour to connect rods. It's uh, usually a challenge. Uh, with S2 AI, uh, it has become less. And the prominence of the screw is also less. Uh, with the low profile screws. Uh, I've come uh, showing you a few cases. This is a case where uh, it was an antrogen spondylitis. A long construct was planned and uh, so we planned to go to pelvic fixation and we used the S2 AI screw in spite of poor bone quality and we achieved a good uh, correction. This is a case of a traumatic L5-S1 fracture dislocation. The S1 was uh, the S1 was breached on one side, so we preferred uh, avoiding the S1 uh, completely, and we used the S2 uh, AI screws uh, for this uh, fixation. The complications, even uh, uh, with these screws, you need to consider the pelvic ability when you are putting these screws. So you need to have a CT scan. You need to measure your lens on that. You need to measure the uh, angulation. The breach rates are around 2 to 3 percent uh, for these screws, but it is usually not that significant that it is away from neurovascular uh, structures. Uh, some case reports have come on which have shown that there might be an insufficiency fracture uh, of the sacrum when you are using these screws in osteoporotic bones. Sometimes, in when you are using uh, the, the Pelvic fixation, you need to plan an unorthodox fixation. It's a four rod technique, Babu also showed. It was basically aggregated by Shen et al., in which they have basically used uh, four rods to uh, replicate more fixation points uh, below. The technique is challenging because you need to plan beforehand, you need to plan uh, uh, your expo uh, your which screws which will be attached, and they have to be in line with those screws. So this is a case of a tuberculosis spine with a completely destroyed uh, S1 and partially destroyed L5. Uh, we use uh, a two-rod technique. This is a case done by uh, my uh, colleague, Don uh, Tarun. So we have, we have used four-rod techniques uh, for uh, fixation. The technique, uh, believe me, it's quite challenging. You need to do a quite large exposure. You need to plan your rods. Uh, difficult, so it may be used when you have a difficult situation that you have a sacrum, uh, you do a sacrum dissection, and you have a poor anterior support. So it is usually preferred when you have a poor anterior su uh, support. 
In summary, the S1 screw should be bicortical to tricortical. If the S1 alas screws are weak, they should be avoided uh, whenever possible. Uh, longer constructs, reduction spondylolisthesis when you're doing high grade spondyl reduction, you expect osteoporosis or you have a pseudo arthritis where there is a bracket and you can move to a pelvic supplementation as compared to the uh, sacral fixation. Uh, the iliac screw, in spite of giving good biomechanically good stable uh, fixation points, they usually have a problem of being prominent. The S2 iliac screw is a good replacement to iliac screw. Uh, they are just they are just the new kid on the block. And whenever you have a difficult situation, you need to consider unorthodox reconstructions. You might need to consider use the iliac rod fixation technique. Uh, for this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, since we are running a bit over time, I think we'll skip the questions and people will start saying that we are too late. So, okay. So, next up is Dr. Ashish from now from Thoracolumbar and Sacral Spine. We move to cervical. And Dr. Ashish Upadhyay will cover the basic instrumentation for C spine. Dr. Ashish, are you there? Please start sharing. Uh, Chetan, can you please share my yes, talk? Uh, yes, I wasn't one second, sir. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful talk, uh, Abhishek. Uh, and a lot of uh, what I should be talking about has been covered in the biomechanics section, as well as in the history section, as well as in certain other talks. So, um, the instrumentation part of the cervical spine is a pretty... Uh, complex area because the cervical spine is has got different anatomical features in different vertebrae, especially this uh, the um, cephalid part of the cervical spine, as well as the fact that it is the end of the spine. So there is much less to go back to if you have to do a salvage. So there are no, uh, no, there are less second chances in the cervical spine. So when you decide about the instrumentation, it is very important that uh, we uh, have a fair idea about the anatomy and exactly the kind of uh, uh, instrumentation that we are going to use. I am not able to advance the uh, this uh, the slides, so thank you. So is someone going to do that for me all the time? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So I'll keep on saying next and next. Yeah, so the types of instrument. Yeah, okay. Yes. Keep on, okay. Yeah, Good old style way wherein we used to use the. Just give me one second, sir. Just give me one second. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but we should not be feeling that the uh, proximal cervical area is a no-go territory for us. So the types of instrumentation can be anterior and posterior. The anterior is uh, for the uh, atlanto-axial part, mostly uh, limited to dense. Then the plates and screws come into play for the uh, sub-axial area. Uh, the, there are different kind of uh, uh, instrumentations in the sub-axial uh, area, which include the interbody spacers, which are the workhorse of uh, the anterior spine instrumentation, and the uh, plates and screws. Now, plates and screws can be of various types and uh, varieties. The posterior, as again, we know, are much wider range of uh, uh, instrumentation. It can go from translaminar screws to lateral mass screws to the pedicle screws to the transarticular screws, the par screws. You know, um, the salvage by doing the uh, stainless steel wires and the, um, the more different uh, instrumentations of uh, laminoplasty uh, plate screw systems, which are the more motion sparing uh, procedures. So I'll try to kind of quickly go through because a lot of these things we already know about, but I'll go through the uh, essential points that we need to be very careful about when we, are when we are choosing to operate on or instrument the cervical spine. The positioning is critical. The cervical spine is the most mobile region of the vertebral column. And it has the uh, headlights mounted on it. The eyes are on top of it. The head is on top of it. So any, uh, it's less forgiving. So if you have a little bit uh, awkward fixation of the cervical spine, it's going to lead to a lot of difficulties to the patient in terms of the visualization, the eye field, the eye level. Uh, and uh, it's going to come back to bite us. And uh, we have to be very careful in the positioning. So for anterior cervical decompression and uh, uh, fusions, you always, it's a supine position, but still you have to make sure that you have been able to maintain a good cervical lordosis. Cervical lordosis helps you with keeping the head straight up and be able to see forward appropriately. Same thing, but more difficult sometimes to achieve is the posterior positioning. There are different ways of posterior positioning. The easiest of that is not using any skull traction, just putting it on a horseshoe shaped uh, uh, support. But there are better or more robust ways of holding the head by using either the Mayfield tongs uh, or by using the Gardner Wells tongs. The advantage of Gardner Wells tongs are is that it can be changed intraoperatively a little bit more than the uh, relatively older variety of the Mayfield uh, traction unit or Mayfield attachment unit. Uh, the more recent additions, uh, which is the meso system, allows you to intraoperatively also change the head and the cervical spine orientation. But we have to make sure that we are able to maintain a cervical lordosis as best as we can. And at the same time, we can keep the eye level horizontal at the very least. Because uh, the cervical spine fusions are going to lead to a lot of stiffness and inability to move the head and very limited ability to compensate for it, especially if you're doing a long spine fusion or long spine instrumentation. So we'll start with the upper cervical spine. Um, I, I'll try to kind of minimize it because we don't see that many patients of this. And there's a lot more to talk about in the upper cervical spine, but I'll try to kind of quickly go through it so that we cover the most uh, important points. The craniovertebral fixation is done through the plate and uh, rod system. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and a screw is a screw. You just have, and in the cervical spine, you don't have to worry, and the uh, occiput, you don't have to worry so much about going medial or lateral. You go straight in as long as you're going into the thick part of the bone and are not going too deep into the, into the brain or the uh, dural tissue. Even with that, you can get away with a lot more than you will get away with if you're putting it, it, the instrumentation or the screws in the uh, cervical spine or the thoracic spine or the lumbar spine. So contrary to what we would tend to think a, the occipital screws are relatively more straightforward uh, than uh, the spinal screws. We'll come to the atlanto-axial system, the odontoid screws anteriorly. We'll first go for the anterior, the atlanto-axial system. Usually we'll come across uh, the fractures of the uh, atlanto-axial axis, uh, most common of which is the odontoid screws. We all know about the indications for the odontoid screw fixation. 
The type 2 fractures would be usually the ones uh, which, especially with the displacement and reduction, can be achieved. One, either one or two screws can be applied. Uh, two screws, depending on if there is enough uh, real estate available for putting into two screws. They are basically cannulated screws that you have to put through by making a an approach similar to the ACDF approach. The advantages are that it's a single screw fixation and you get, you put the screws in, you get done with it, You have you, the exposure is straightforward ACDF exposure. The disadvantage is that if, and it is quite possible, that the screws may cut through. You have to go as far deep into the, as far into the superior cortex as you can and you try to put in the bicortical screws, but if you go wrong, the cutout of the screws, especially in osteoporotic older uh, patients, can be uh, more of a disaster. And then you have to remove the screw either in, and in some cases, you even have to do a odontoid uh, resection and then go back to do what we'll talk about next. This is the posterior uh, C1, C2 area, the atlanto axial area. The C1 vertebra is basically a ring, atlas. So that ring unfortunately has got little real estate to put in the screws. So you have one chance of getting it right. And if you don't get it right, you don't have the second chance other than if you want to go into the occiput. You cannot go into the proximal vertebra because there's none available. So you have to always be very careful that you get a CAT scan of the cervical spine before you approach doing the instrumentation for the posterior cervical spine, definitely. I do it also for the ACDFs and the anterior cervical instrumentation, but doing it for the posterior cervical instrumentation is essential. It's, uh, I wouldn't call it malpractice not to do it, but it, it gets pretty close to it because then you are being very cavalier with uh, trying to understand this. So the um, atlas, there is only a lateral mass, even lateral mass screw for which the techniques have been described. They're basically all the same. You just, and by the end of having put the screws in, you realize, and once you've done the x-rays, then you realize which technique you used in the middle. But one of the techniques is when you go directly into the lateral mass, more inferiorly. One is the technique wherein you use the, uh, the, the arch, the posterior arch of the vertebra to make the entry point. The problem with the posterior arch is that you can break the lamina because the lamina is very thin there. The third approach is to try to go in between. So try to make create a notch by using a high-speed burr and then go through it. Uh, the one thing that now I'll talk about the, uh, the vital structures that you have to think about when you are going into the atlanto axial area, the two vital structures, well, three. One is the spinal cord, which is a very obvious choice for everyone uh, to try and avoid. The two most important structures that kind of give you a headache or uh, frustration or annoyance when you are doing this uh, screw is the vertebral artery, which emerges out of the tra uh, transverse vertebral foramen for of the C2 vertebra and goes arches over. In most, in many cases, it is passing through a groove, and in some cases, there is a foramen through which it's passing. But good news is that unlike in the rest of the vertebral bodies, in the rest of the cervical spine, the vertebral artery is quite easily visible. So you can avoid it just by direct visualization, as long as you're just being careful, which if you're doing a spine surgery, you got to be. The second vital structure that annoys you more than worries you is the uh, C2 uh, nerve root. The C2 nerve root passes just underneath uh, the, uh, the arch of the C1, and you have to be careful that you do not injure it in such a way that it starts giving you neuralgic pain. If uh, And a lot of times, uh, this nerve root has been sacrificed without causing much of a functional problem, but it certainly can cause you power problems if you do not recognize the presence of this nerve root. So the posterior C1 screws, as we know, we can get uh, all sorts of uh, videos and uh, um, in this age of internet, we can get a lot of information about how to put the screws and the pitfalls is what I'm more worried about, that we do not have much uh, second chances or any second chances for this. Uh, the C2 screws um, uh, would be a far more versatile area. The C2 is 
very aptly called the axis. It is certainly both literally and metaphorically the axis of the uh, cervical spine. Everything rotates around it, quite literally so. So it has a very complex anatomy, but thankfully, thankfully has got much more real estate compared to the C1 vertebra. The uh, lamina is thick and big. The spinous processes are bifid and big. Uh, the lateral mass, which basically is, uh, is an extension of the pedicle and the pars and everything to put together, is pretty big as well. So you can put both the lateral mass screw, the power screw, the pedicle screw, and then you have the advantage of being able to use the lamina for putting in the screws. And on top of that, uh, you can even put the uh, trans. Uh, you, you can put the uh, trans um, articular screws at the C1, C2 junction. So C2 screw, the, the uh, one thing that one needs to be always careful about when you're doing a posterior cervical approach is the attachment of a lot of musculature and uh, the ligaments onto the spinous process of the C2 vertebra. Because the head is held high over the cervical spine with the help of these ligaments and the muscles. So, and if you, if you are especially going subaxially, you should be extremely careful about not touching any of these structures. And if you're going supra axially too, uh, then too, you should be very careful. All these muscles that keep the head straight and help you from bending it, uh, help you from dropping it down are there, right there. So be careful about that, that part. Uh, this is again, you divide, like in all of the cervical spine posteriorly, you divide the... Uh, uh, the lateral mass into four quadrants and use the center point as the reference point for going into the uh, the pars or into the lateral mass. So the pars screws are directed more infero superiorly, uh, and then as you go further up, you can go if you just extend the pars screw super, uh, inferior superiorly, you can straight away go into the um, uh, uh, transarticular pattern of the screw placement and this can simply act as your stabilizer for the cervical uh, for the atlantoaxial um, segment. Once again you have to be very careful about the vertebral artery and the C2 nerve root because the vertebral foramen is just next door. Um, the other varieties of screws if you put if you put uh, the entry point more laterally and direct it more medially, it's a pedicle screw, it becomes a pedicle screw. If you go more straight, it becomes a par screw. But the, uh, the real good time saver, and perhaps to some extent you may call it a safer bet, is to try and put the laminar screw. The translaminar screws uh, for the C2 are very useful because you can see the whole of the bone. First of all, the, the lamina is pretty big and thick. Number two, it's right in front of your eyes. So if you're putting the screws in, you can see everywhere. You can pretty much direct it where you're going in. And even though you, you still can sometimes come out and, uh, and sometimes there are variations wherein the lamina is smaller, you still have a very good hold into the lamina and you have enough place, enough space, and you can direct it rather easily if you're an orthopedic surgeon by blood. So then... We'll go down to the subaxial spine, which is the usual area. 90% of our problems uh, or uh, the surgeries we deal with, or 80% perhaps, are in the subaxial spine, which consists of the um, vertebrae from C3 to C7. The C3 to 6, we'll go first anteriorly and then come back to the posterior part. The C3 to 6, uh, you can deal with doing a, a ACDF. And for the Posterior part, you use the lateral mass screws typically, even though a lot of people say that you can still use, uh, and some people do use the pedicle screws. Uh, but a lateral mass screw is easy to put, quicker to put, less chances of, uh, 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 well, to put the long story short, it's more straightforward uh, and provides equally good fixation uh, compared to the uh, pedicle screws. The C7 vertebra in particular, the anterior uh, part can be fixed by using the ACDF techniques. 
The posterior part, you can put the lateral mass screw also, but the lateral mass tends to be very small and the pedicle seems to uh, tends to be pretty good. And that's the reason that you use pedicle screws C7 onwards. And the other reason that you use uh, C7 pedicle screws with more impunity is because the vertebral artery is not yet in close association with the uh, cervical spine yet. There is no, there can be variations again wherein there is a C7 vertebral foramen and the vertebral artery is passing through that, but those are very few. And this again makes it very important to be able to evaluate the CT scan. You should, one should be obsessed with looking at the CAT scans of the cervical spine before you go into the surgery, so much so that you never have to get back to the CAT scan. It should all be stored in your mind. And you should have a second instinct of, uh, uh, of knowing what was going on. And you should know what and where you're going. So anterior uh, uh, instrumentation for the cervical spine, I'll start with the standalone cages, which come in two varieties, a cage with an anchor and a cage with the, uh, with the screws. They both act pretty much in the same way. And uh, uh, even though I have... Uh, I did not like it right from the beginning for for the reason that my very first case with this did not go well. Uh, that's why I kind of walked away from it a little bit. But it certainly has the advantage that it is flushed down the anterior part of the vertebral body, and it does not have the uh, you know you do not go over the anterior vertebral surface to cause any issues with adjacent level uh, osteophyte formation. The disadvantage is that sometimes, and this is the disadvantage I quote from my own experience, that sometimes when you're putting in the screws, you may end up distracting the disc space and that can lead to a non-union. And uh, also at times this can lead to subsidence because the screw becomes loose. The stresses are not being uh, controlled on top of the uh, intervertebral disc spacer. With the anchor, you can just go in, you just have to bang it in and put a, uh, a, a screw back off stopper, which we call as the um, uh, locking screw in the back so that it does not back off. Uh, the next one is the standalone cage with the screws that go in. Once again, it's the same thing that you use with the uh, anchor. The screws um, go in, they get a hold for you, and uh, you put the um, locking screw in the, to prevent the backing off of the screws. Again, the advantage is that you have screw threads, which have a better chance of preventing the loosening of the spacer. And the disadvantage is that it's, uh, again, because you're putting in the screws, there are more chances of uh, distracting the disc space as you go in with the screw. Uh, now, ACDF, the workhorse for most of the spine surgeries is the ACDF. The ACDF uh, consists of decompression and fusion with the interbody spacer as well as the plate screw system, which is currently in vogue as uh, earlier on um, uh, Saurabh told us. Previously, there was no instrumentation done for uh, anterior cervical decompression infusions. You would just put a dowel of the graft taken from the, uh, the iliac crest and that will stay there and fuse like, like a dream. But as time progressed, there were some instances wherein the graft was dislodged and that resulted into a kyphotic deformity and the collapse of the vertebra. And the whole advantage of doing an ACDF was lost because of the dislodgement of the, uh, of the graft. So the plates were started and the plates come in different varieties. Uh, one is a single row plate, which has been shown to be biomechanically inferior, but in terms of getting the fusion equally good to the double row plates. So the single row plate uh, is single screw at each level. It's the advantage is that it can be put easily, quick, more quickly, even though I would tend to disagree with you with, with that because uh, the second screw only takes another extra minute for the three or four level if you are doing it that much. The disadvantage is, as we talked about, uh, being biomechanically found to be slightly inferior. But uh, it just gives you more satisfaction that you have covered the graft both anteriorly on both the sides and you're getting a better fixation 
and more axial rotatory uh, uh, fixation is obtained. The double row plate is the typical one that we use. I try to use the minimal length of the plate possible for, uh, um, for the level involved. Sometimes you have to go slightly longer than you want to go, but if you can avoid going any more than you need to be, you should do that. And uh, the screws should be put more divergent in the uh, cephalo caudate direction and convergent in the uh, more mediolateral direction. The advantages, as I mentioned, this is the gold standard of using uh, the anterior plates. The disadvantages are uh, that you may, because you're putting two screws on both the sides, I have seen several people put the screw more divergent into the, um, um, into the foramen and then uh, causing radicular pain as a result. So a patient comes out from after the ACDF, says that I've got more pain than I had prior to surgery. The one option to do is a CAT scan to find out if you put the screw into the uh, intervertebral foramen. And more often than not, you will find that uh, you put the screw directly into the vertebral canal and that's what is irritating the exiting nerve root. As again, I'll re-emphasize, the axial rotation obtained by the double row plates is better than the axial rotation given by the single row plates. So that's why it is uh, typically used by most people. Uh, interbody spacers. So interbody spacers can be autograft, which is the iliac crest bone graft. Some people can even use a fibular uh, slice they can take out from the fibula. Uh, the allograft, which is a uh, cadaveric bone graft, which is again tricortical allograft. Peak cages, as uh, uh, I think Saurabh was describing, someone had described already, the peak cages have the maximum, the, the closest modulus of elasticity to the um, uh, bone. So it gives you the best, uh, the closest one possible. Titanium uh, uh, cages are also used and a lot of people tend to use more and more. Porous coated titanium cages are becoming more in vogue nowadays. The problem with titanium is because it's metal and hard, it tends to subside. And uh, it has, although I must also say that I have that feeling, but I have not seen a subsided titanium cage ever because, because of the footprint, perhaps. And uh, nowadays, with more porous coating coming along, the fusion rates may increase, and that will prevent uh, more of the uh, subsidence. The allograft, I'll tell you again, I, this is my preferred uh, uh, method, my preferred material, because I find that because it's an allograft, it is bound to have the closest uh, density of bone as to the live bone that I'm using it in. However, I must also admit that I've had several uh, instances of subsidence, possibly because I pre over prepared my end plate, or possibly because I overstuffed the inter, inter uh, vertebral disc space. These are the two major reasons for uh, um, getting it wrong or causing a subsidence because we become overzealous about trying to get a better indirect reduction by overstuffing it and uh, end up causing more stresses on the end plates. Corpectomy cages. Now, corpectomy cages come in a variety of things nowadays. The corpectomy cages can be a simple fibula, uh, iliac crest, tricortical grafts made longer and, and fashioned in such a way that it can come and accommodate in the, uh, uh, into the intervertebral, into the corpectomy area that has, that has been created. Peak cages, peak cages can come as expandable as well as stackable cages. So nowadays, stackable peak cages are coming so that you can stack them up and make it to the height that you want it to be. Again, expandable titanium cages are there, titanium pyramid cage. And uh, uh, I'll talk about something that Saurabh mentioned that there is... Uh, um, that there is, there are a couple of papers which say that using a titanium cage in infections sort of prevents infection, uh, and uh, it's a stud There are several studies that have shown that, but uh, and for that reason, it is perhaps more useful to use that in uh, um, 
in cases of infections, especially in India, wherein a lot of patients have tuberculosis and other things. And pyramid cages are also very good because it gives you a, a more biological environment because the bone graft is looking around and looking out. So you can have, you can stuff the pyramid cage much more and much better by using uh, the graft you, you obtained. Also, hemicorpectomy. This is one good way described by Dan Rue that uh, you can just do a hemilaminectomy that will give you some residual stability from the remaining part of the, uh, of the vertebral body and put a fibula adjacent to the part of the bone that you left behind. So cut the fibula into a bicortical graft and use that. It gives you an inherent stability and allows you a better chance of fusion uh, because the bigger problem with a um, with a longer construct is always the fact that you are uh, you have a longer lever arm. Again, going back to the basic science um, talk, uh, the longer the lever arm, the more are the chances of loosening and losing the fixation. Combination of uh, the instrumentation. The rule of thumb I follow is that uh, if you are putting doing a three level fusion, then an ACDF plate is good enough. If you're going any further than that, if you're doing a four level fusion, I think it's a better idea to put a standalone cage along with the uh, plate, gra plate graft system that you're using distally. The reason for that is, and some people may say that, you know, even after a two level, a third level should be I possibly used with a standalone cage. Uh, but the reason is that because of the natural curvature, the natural uh, lordotic curvature of the uh, of the cervical spine, if you try to bend the plate beyond a certain degree, you're going to lose the ability to put the screws in uh, with the locking mechanism in place. So in other words, if you're putting in a larger plate, if you're bending a plate beyond a certain de degree, then you are going to spoil the screw heads the sc or the screw holes. And that's why beyond a certain limit, you should not try to bend the plate and you should use a standalone cage along with the, the thing. The other combination I have often used is if you am going more than two levels and if it is possible, some people suggest that rather than having to fuse four different surfaces, four different graft host surfaces, you should, you should be, you might be better off only fusing two graft host surfaces because, uh, there are less surfaces to fuse. So that's where some people have recommended or have said that doing a corpectomy and putting it on a pyramid cage gives you a better chance of fusion. That being said, it's less biological. So um, it is uh, uh, subject to questioning. Coming back to the posterior cervical spine, the lateral mass, uh, mass screws, as I mentioned, C3 to C6, and sometimes even if you get lucky, C7, are the workhorse and uh, uh, the traditional way of putting in these uh, screws is again the Roy Camille and Miguel. These two techniques are used and they have been modified by people in the course of publishing papers and uh, they remain more or less the same. The Miguel is more uh, uh, corded to cephalid orientation and more mediolateral uh, uh, orientation. The Roy Camille is more straight, going straight up and down into, into, the, um, into the lateral mass and going more straight mediolaterally. So Anderson combined the two and called it an Anderson te technique by going more, <laughs> uh, uh, more mediolateral, um, uh, go going more straight mediolaterally and going inferior superior. Uh, on the other hand, Howard N made it his own technique by causing, by doing uh, it the other way. So the permutation and combinations have been used. Essentially, the whole idea is to put the screw through the lateral mass. The, it is much more forgiving because if you go superior and inferior, you're still going into a, uh, a facet joint, which is fine because you are essentially going to fuse the facet joint anyway. The only problem is that the screw may become a little loose uh, because of lack of support from all around the screw. On top of that, when you're trying to 
decorticate the facet joint, you will come across that the screw is right, looking right at, the, at you. So you may want to stuff that area with more bone graft to make it more solid. Uh, but still, it should work fine. The only thing, the two things that you have to worry about is not to hit the nerve root and not to hit the vertebral artery. Other than that, it's a pretty straightforward uh, placement of the screws. Now, cervical pedicle screws. Um, I know certain people uh, say that the uh, cervical pedicle screws are better to put in uh, the cervical spine because they give you a better anchor uh, and deeper anchor, even though they are a little more technically demanding and challenging to put in. Uh, my take on that is that uh, the cervical spine is a pretty is not like cervical spine or thoracic spine, which is holding a lot of weight. Yes, it is taking a lot of uh, torsional forces and a lot of uh, lever arm because of the mobility of the cervical spine, but still it is not subject to the amount of forces with the mass being put on it. So putting in the pedicle screws uh, up to C6 is my way to go. And at C7, and if you need to put the screws at C2, these are the two places wherein I would consider putting in the pedicle screws. Uh, the difference between the pedicle screw and the lateral mass screw is the lateral mass screw will more laterally or more centrally, and the pedicle screw has to be directed more medially. The two things that the pedicle screw has got to avoid uh, very assiduously and fastidiously is the vertebral artery laterally and the uh, spinal cord medially. The laminar hooks. Enough has been talked about by, uh, by Bhavuk about the laminar hooks. They are certainly uh, very useful when you are trying to salvage a situation. However, they are much more useful in the proximal and the distal part of the cervical spine, wherein you are more likely to have a situation wherein you uh, had to salvage uh, the situation. So it works out better and you can put the screws with a offset on the side and then you can use the... Um, the offset connectors, the cross links, the domino links uh, for stabilization. To afford further torsional strength to the construct, you can use the uh, inter the, the rod cross links to, you know, as uh, I think Bhavuk talked about, as well as uh, uh, Birinder talked about uh, the advantages of giving more torsional strength to the construct. The stainless steel wires cannot be forgotten because these are the ones that are often considered unglamorous, and uh, uh, but they are safe unless they break down. Especially, people yes. might be feeling a bit hungry, so you need to. Yeah. yeah. So we are just about done. So the posterior Sorry. augmentation after the anterior uh, decompression and fusions, and if you have relatively more stability, the uh, stainless steel wires can be used. The laminoplasty plates, again, we know the laminoplasty is a motion sparing procedure. This, the plates uh, are used to just open up and hold the lamina together. Uh, thank you very much. That's about it. Yeah, thanks, Ashish. Uh, brilliant talk, I must say. And it was a huge topic to cover both. And I think you covered almost everything, right? From C0, C1 to C1, C2 and anterior posterior and given your perspective. Brilliant talk, I must say. Right, and a difficult job you have done because it was <laughs> such a big topic. Thanks. Um, I think we'll take the questions because already we are late. Uh, Abhishek must be feeling very hungry if he's already not had the dinner. So Abhishek, you're next up. I think without wasting time, let's go on. Uh, first of all, I already had my dinner. Huh, so that's right. Now we can go late into the night. That's not an issue. <laughs> that's not a hint, huh? And uh, so I'll begin my talk. First of all, uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, perfect. And can you hear me loud and clear, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, at the outset, I would like to thank the DOA for giving me opportunity and especially to Professor Manny and Professor uh, Kamran sir uh, to give me this talk. And uh, also I would like to thank all the panelists who have come before me because they have covered 
everything which you know uh, i needed to cover but so my talk will be more of a you know as a philosophical overview of uh, complications uh, related to spine instrumentation rather than actually going into details of the technique because i think people have already covered that giving the you know relevant example from their clinical practice so the topic of my talk is how to avoid complications in spine instrumentation so i'll start with some quotations from literature that you know a busy surgeon will always have complication throughout his or her career no matter how meticulously and carefully he or she performs the surgery so we should always bear this in mind that complications are going to happen so we have to be ready to deal with them and also as we say a surgeon who has no complication is a surgeon who either does not operate or is not truthful so having complications is not a matter of shame but uh, having outsized you know incidence of complication is something which is worrying and one should look into their practice uh this is something that you know people don't talk publicly and they share their concerns privately when they have so it is something which everyone wants to talk but there there are no adequate forums on which you can talk openly about you know how we are going to and what is the rate in their own practice so i think it is a very under discussed and uh, under reported problem and the last is how the surgeon deals with complications that arise intraoperatively or postoperatively is one of the key components that separates a great surgeon from one who is average so if you want to have a long flourishing career in spine surgery complications are going to happen it is this line which is going to decide whether you are going to be you know successful or you are going to be feeling miserable you know when you have one of these so coming to the spine uh, as we all know dennis is the one who popularized the three column concept uh, where the anterior column bears the axial weight resist extension uh, the middle column bears weight and resist flexion and posterior column you know provides flexion and stability during rotation and lateral bending and that is why we use pedicle screws because it allows us to control all the three uh, columns in spine and uh, because it can, uh, captures all the three columns it has got lower pull out strength and therefore higher fusion rates it helps us achieve our desired aim of surgery better which can be correction of deformity stability or whatever you know be the aim and it also helps to protect the correction or whatever you know uh, stability which we have given so when uh, we think about pedicle screws which is the workhorse where which is now commonly used for thoracic and lumbar surgeries and going into pelvic and ilium also so the structures which are at risk you know are commonly if we go medially then you know it is the spinal cord or the nerve roots which are there if we go far laterally then there are lungs and if we go anterior and laterally then you know in worst case we can hit an artery which can be a catastrophe and uh, can be even death on table also so these are the three main structures which we have to keep in mind when we are you know placing pedicle screws especially in thoracic and uh, in lumbar region some structures are different but more or less these are the three sides which you have to take care of so first is we have to be aware where the increased post operative risk and difficulties are there so it is usually seen in deformities where the anatomy is not clear or it is under developed or it is deformed such as in scoliosis spondylolisthesis or spondylolysis in infection certain anatomical structures may be damaged or the quality of and the strength may not be as much as you expect tumors osteoporosis pre existing instabilities if you had previous surgery and when you do inadequate investigations and you don't plan well whether it is a clinical planning or radiological planning or even an emotional planning so what are the main pedicle screw insertion techniques uh, you know dr kamran and uh, 
Dr. Pankaj have already gone through this. So mainly it are, they are freehand, fluoroscopic assisted, funnel technique, navigation, electrostimulation and robotics. So freehand is the workhorse and it is most commonly done for thoracic and lumbar spine. Highly accurate and safety is questionable, but you know, most of the studies put it at par with other available methods at this point of time. So even the recent study showed that, you know, using O-arm and robotic guidance when compared to freehand was uh, reasonably well when it came to accuracy as well as the, you know, ease of use. So first we'll start with cervical spine. Uh, there are a lot of events. If we go into the complications, then there's a long list. Uh, I think Dr. Ashish has already, you know, mentioned about major, major, you know, complications which can be anticipated in anterior surgery. But I'll be talking about two very, you know, specific complications which are esophageal and vertebral artery injury. So esophageal injury, the incidence is very low, thankfully. And it is usually because of inappropriate retractor placement or excessive force or intraoperative trauma with sharp instruments. Uh, however, there is one more reason where people are not able to identify the anatomy and they attribute injury to esophagus, to retractor placement or whatever, you know, other things which are mentioned above. But I think identifying the esophagus during the anterior exposure is paramount and uh, sometimes putting an NG tube also helps because you can palpate it during the surgery if you are not able to differentiate. I'm aware of, you know, people just because of anatomical confusion went into, you know, esophagus and they had an injury. However, without any major consequence because it was identified and managed. So what is the presentation? It is usually the intraoperative detection. Hence, we have to keep our vigil very high when, you know, we have finished the surgery. We should always look for, you know, esophageal injuries. Also, in immediate post-op, if there is fever, neck swelling, dysphagia or wound abscess, then also it should be thought about. And uh, intraoperatively, you can detect by, you know, uh, putting indigo carmine dye through NGT and see for a leak. And consequences, it's, it's a problem which has got a very high mortality rate. You know, 20% if it is treated within 24 hours. And after 24 hours, it reaches up to 50%. So, it is a very important thing. So, as I told you, prevention is the key. Anatomical identification of correct plane paramount. Retractor teeth should be under longus coli and not directly abutting the esophagus. And it should be directly protected when you are using high-speed bar or using any sharp instruments. Now, coming to vertebral artery. As we know, it arises from subclavian artery and it, they, these are the various divisions. You can have anomalous vertebral arteries. So, you know, you need to be careful when you are analyzing scan preoperatively. You should look out for the normal course of vertebral artery as much as possible. You should sit with the radiologist and discuss the course and see if there are any anomalous vertebral arteries, loops or anything like that, which can prevent an injury during the surgery. So these are the common mechanisms of vertebral artery injury. You know, in anterior spine, you know, when you do an excessively wide corpectomy, you hit the, you know, vertebral foramen and you injure it. When you do an oblique corpectomy because you are lost or because the retractor pushes you and doesn't give you the correct axis or when you are pulling the shoulders or putting a sandbag under the scapula, then the patient might tilt more towards one side and that leads you to doing an oblique corpectomy. Off-center corpectomy you know, when you do an off-center corpectomy and you lose the vertebral, you know, orientations because of the landmarks which you have destroyed or they are destroyed by some pathology. And then the tortuosity of the vertebral foramen. So you can see here that this is an abnormal vertebral foramen which could easily have been picked in an, you know, a CT scan or in an, you know, sometimes even in MRI you can make out that. Then the second is posterior spine. When we are doing C1-C2 transarticular screw, when we put two medial lateral mass screw and over dissection lateral to the lateral mass. So what is the management of vertebral artery? As usual for all complications, prevention is always better. You should be well versed with the anatomy in that area. If you have a complication, first of all, notify the anesthetist. 
if the anesthetist is not in the room ask him to come immediately there ask for blood and ask for help so asking help is not a bad thing you know you should not be cavalier when you are in surgery and you are having a complication so you can ask for help of a vascular surgeon and meanwhile you can do direct tamponade if the direct tamponade doesn't control then you can do direct repair proximal and distal ligation or if nothing works then you know with the help of intervention radiologist you can do endovascular stenting so the first principle to avoid any complication what i feel is bite what you can chew so we see all these fancy fancy x rays and you know people operating complex cases and deformities and you know we get carried away sometimes with that but we should know our limitations so therefore when you are going out in practice or if you are an orthopedic surgeon who is venturing out into spine surgery then start with a straight forward cases with classical symptoms and also you should know the correct indications and contraindications because if complication happens then everything will be scrutinized first by the hospital committee who will look at it and then god forbid if it goes in goes into the court of law then it will be a very close scrutiny so your indication should be right and you should be doing things what is prescribed and even then if you have complications you have better chance of holding everywhere then always have a plan as i told you that pre op planning is essential for flawless execution get appropriate imaging such as ct mri and x ray don't get you know rushed that the patient is going there or you have to take him to theater immediately if you think an imaging can help you reduce the complications then you should definitely go for it plan beforehand go with a planned approach and be prepared for complications always have a plan b like we always have in life you know so this is the case where and then the next thing which comes is that you should know your tools know the implant system and access system like you know tubular retractors or whatever you are using for exposure you should be aware with that it should not become as a surprise in operation theater when that you are using it for the first time you don't know you are fiddling and on top of that when you have a complication then you know you lose track of everything there are too many variables to deal with at that point of time so know the implant system and access system beforehand and in detail it is a good practice to bring it to your outpatient department or operation theater one day prior to the surgery and understand everything from the person who knows and preferably who is going to be in operation theater to help you follow the standard manual for equipment use and also learn to improvise and don't lose common sense in operation theater sometimes common sense can save you from big misery and it is your responsibility to know how to use your tools no one else is going to do that so you can't blame your uh, you know fellow or a con junior consultant or you know the resident that you know it is your responsibility it is not it is your responsibility you are the team leader you are the one who is the man in charge there so man up and always make sure that your tools are running so it's a good idea to check the burr before you know you start your surgery you can put these things in your customized checklist that cm is working the x and the other equipments are working then you should always believe in teamwork it is not a one man show there are always people around you know so as we say there is always a woman behind a man so there is always a team of people behind a surgeon a surgeon can be as good as his team so if your anesthetist is not good your neurophysiologist is not good your radiographer who is showing the x rays your scrubber is not good your assistant surgeon you cannot be good that is as simple as that and i am sure everyone is aware of that and if you are good to them and you have got a good team then they will help you mitigate the complications in the best possible manner so as uh, dr kamran had told that you know dry exposure is the key it visualizes the anatomy 
you should be familiar with the alternate trajectories while putting the pedicle screws you know these are the ones everyone has talked about that you know uh, the cortical the and then uh, you should also be aware of uh, alternative trajectories in lateral mass these various techniques to put then you should be adept in using fluoroscopic ass assisted screws other than the free hand because if you get stuck you can check it and you know put and if nothing works then don't shy to open up the lamina do a laminectomy feel the pedicle anatomically and visually and then put the screw use intraoperative navigation and robotics if it is available but they have a high learning curve these are expensive acquisitions and registration is a problem they are cumbersome uh, and uh, still sometimes they need ct or a fluoroscopy they improve accuracy uh, sometimes you know but uh, still as we are seeing that these technologies are evolving but they hold a lot of promise for future applications so techniques which can be used to increase pull out strength is that larger diameter screws but they should not be too big a diameter so that they blow out the pedicle screw length should be 2/3 to 80% into the body the pitch can be increased and we can use crossling if you are doing osteotomy or three column reconstructions these are some of the revision techniques when you are stuck so you can use alternative trajectories as already described you can use fluoroscopic you can use a cannulated tap in revised trajectory to dilate or redirect the track because there is a tendency that the screw goes into the old track so you can put a k wire or you can put a guide wire and then you know put a cannulated tap on it so that it doesn't go anywhere else other than the trajectory you intend to put in use larger diameter screws of same size and use a sharp awl or drill so using a sharp awl helps which is counterintuitive and lot of people are scared of using a sharp awl but sharp awl helps you be accurate when you are trying to put into a pedicle which is narrow or sclerotic and then you can use funnel or slide technique use combination of techniques to put you know and check it under fluoroscopy or if oam navigation whatever is available you should be aware of alternative techniques uh, and you should keep them handy uh, like uh, dr bhavuk showed uh, you know a versatile use of hook uh, in lot of complex cases hence we should be aware of la you know using laminar transverse process and pedicle hooks also with sublaminar wiring and also sublaminar tapes so the take home message here is there is no such thing as simple spine operation so you should always contemplate about complications and strategies to mitigate them and you should always remember that prevention is better than cure so it is easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble so the time expended in avoiding complications will be more than compensated by the time saved in not having to treat them so if you do things well the patient goes home in 3 days you are fine but if there is some complication the patient stays for longer and you also get sleepless nights and we have to understand that the patient's well being is paramount he is not a guinea pig or you know where you can you know just be frivolous about we have to we are all responsible people and we should keep that thing paramount and therefore keeping a plan for complications is very important and also a spine surgeon should never hesitate to request consultation or assistance during the surgery if you are having a complex case it always pay is better to have two people than one you can ask your colleague or a senior to help you or even a junior whatever you feel comfortable with and uh, you know as a wise man said that surgeon should always operate with the meticulousness that they would wish for if they were the patients it has a salutary exercise for surgeons to think of their own feeling and reaction if they had to undergo the procedures being carried out on them or their relatives so then a lot of things will come to our mind which we normally don't think and last but not the least we should remember these four commandments i think if you take these four commandments from today's topic uh i know this is the last lecture everyone is tired but i think these four things can help you 
go a long way. So one is keep your ego out of your operation theater. Second is keep calm and know that speed thrills but kills. So speed is important, but it is not the paramount thing. The paramount thing is patient safety. And don't shirk responsibility. So it's your responsibility. You cannot pass it over. And last is listen, think and speak. So listen to your team, think coolly and calmly when in a problematic situation and ask for suggestions and think over them before rejecting. And last, speak. This is especially for people around the main surgeon that they should speak if they think that something is not going as per their, you know, understanding. So that is how they can alert sometimes situations which can lead to bad complications. Thank you. Thanks, Abhishek. A wonderful lecture. Uh, so they have nicknamed you Professor in the Delhi Spine Society. <laughs> he is, so it was a professorial lecture. Thanks very much. Thanks all the speakers. So now I think I can hand over to Dr. Lalit. Yeah, I think uh, there was an interesting chat going on on cages. If we can uh, speak it out, uh, it will benefit the delegates a lot. It was about uh, being bone being used versus peak being used versus uh, titanium being used. I think uh, there were some good messages in that. So if you can take that uh, take that up for our last uh, yeah, um, desert. Well, I think uh, the message is that, yeah the message is that uh, for fusion, especially in cervical spine and CDF, uh, ICBG or uh, ileic crest bone graft is still the gold standard. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about the surety of fusion with ICBG. The only problem is the morbidity associated. So a lot of surgeons are using uh, those kind of tools, you know, the one which in which like a core biopsy, uh, core biopsy sort of a thing in which you can, you don't have to formally open the eyelid crest to take out the graft. You can just uh, percutaneously take out the graft and then put it. And that, that graft can be used along with the cage because it's not, you can't uh, fashion that graft into a, in the, in the way you can do a tricortical ICBG. So that's one. And then there was about cage and peak. So most of the guys are, are in favor of peak because uh, they are getting consistently good results with peak cage. Um, people are saying that problem with metal cages, that there's a lot of sinkage. Um, but it all depends what kind of graft you are using inside the cage. So how soon, I mean, it has to withstand the uh, you know, it's a race against fusion uh, and the time. So if, if it will only sink if it's not fusing fast enough. So that's my take on that. Uh, what is Dr. Birinder saying? On uh, I haven't gone through the chat. Okay, so the, uh, Abhishek is saying that he got a scare that peak got the sinking, but I think that's mostly for lumbar spine. If you are so, another thing is that you should make sure that cage is large enough and then load the cage at the end of instrumentation. If you are not compressing the cage once you have finished the instrumentation. So make sure even in cervical spine as well as in um, lumbar spine, when you're using cages, you should always load the cage so that it will be too much. So the loading the uh, I think, uh, I think the, the, if we uh, talk about the biomechanical point and the biological point of view, then the metal cages, they are definitely better than the peak cages. But the thing issue with the metal spine, cages, yeah. but the issue with the metal cages is that you cannot see that the fusion across the across the, um, the, the, bo the bones on the x-rays. So that's why the peak cages came in the picture so that you can you know, clearly see the graph and the bridging callus across this thing. Now the problem with peak is that it's a plastic. So the many people, they have concerned that the fusion doesn't occur between the plastic and the bone. So now the people have you know, sir, taken out the, uh, the, uh, the solution for that and they are using the titanium spray in a 3D printed form on the surface of the, of the peak cages. So now the uh, the people, the world is moving towards the 3D printed titanium cages or you can say uh, hybrid cages with the titanium spray coated over the peak. In fact, nowadays even tantalum has come uh, in cages. So like in the joints, tantalum is uh, supposed to be a metal which, you know, uh, it's enhanced bone and growth. So tantalum has also come for cages. So uh, especially uh, newer cages which are there, tantalum might have some... The porous, the porous coating is done by the tantalum. Mm. Uh, material. Also, 
Uh, aren't you using any allograft uh, uh, spacers? We don't have allograft here. Like it's not commercially available. I mean, only centers which are preserving bone, like at AIMS we have, but it's not commercially available. We don't have any allograft available. I use only allograft, just kind of to put it on it's record. I use only good. Yeah. And I also use allograft. for any more than one level fusions because uh, of the uh, concern about achieving the fusion. I use bone stimulator or fusion stimulator that they use for about four hours a day, any more than one level fusion to kind of, and it has given me as well as some of my colleagues who I know here in Yale and all that uh, routinely use uh, bone stimulator. My fellowship days, the you know, metal cages were available for cervical spine. They were available for uh, the peak was also available. But the change point was always not whether to choose a peak or a metal cage. It was always whether the patient is a smoker. So if there was a, any history of smoking, they usually used to prefer the the which was uh, usually used to be available. So they used to use those uh, uh, whenever they were using. They did not unless it's an emergency for any elective cases. If a patient is smoker, they should be given a warning that they should quit smoking about six weeks to three months before and up to six weeks to three months after the surgery. That generally is actually current recommendation around here. So uh, in our setup, we are using a lot of peak, especially in infection also, and we have seen very good results. We are going to come up with a paper also where we have shown that peak is as good as, uh, uh, as uh, titanium in uh, infection as well, uh, especially uh, tubercular infection. So I, so far, I have never had problem with peak. Um, uh, it, it, is, it, yeah. it works well. I think this this talk about uh, titanium being a um, uh, infection present uh, preventer is an urban legend. It's kind of you know someone published a couple of papers and there's no way way to disprove that it is not. So <laughs> I think just the the story goes on. But I think uh, any hardware is as good or as bad as the other ones for uh, infection prevention for the low low grade infections especially. Right. So I guess. Uh... It's time to say thanks to everyone and good night. What do you say, Dr. Lalit? Yeah, I think uh, a very nice uh, evening. Uh, we thought it was a very basic uh, uh, collection of uh, lectures, but I think uh, at the end, uh, it's a very, very useful session. So it always happens that uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association wants more, Jidil Mange more. So before we leave, maybe uh, Ashish, uh, Birender, and uh, maybe Bhavok, uh, or anybody else can uh, tell us what it takes to become a spine surgeon. I think the four commandments uh, Abhishek has already told us, sir. <laughs> Those four commandments, you know, they are a very essential. Wait, complication. wait, wait, Ashish is itching. <laughs> so I, I think I'll quote Tarun Suri on this. Okay. You know, if, if you if you if you are scared of fire, don't cook. Something to that effect, right? <laughs> I'm sure it's it's a there's a long learning curve. It's an evolving science as many other sciences are, and uh, you need mentors, you need institutes. Of course, you need patients uh, to grow over this. And uh, I don't think Virinder is around unless uh, he's not. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, I think. Um, Though we around thousand people were logged in, and I'm sure they're going to revisit these videos as uh, they are available on Omnicurus as well as on DOA website on the DOA library. So I'm sure people are going to revisit and uh, look at all these videos. And thank you from the bottom of my heart and from DOA to taking out uh, your valuable uh, weekend time and. Uh, have a nice weekend. I think Ashish has uh, the maximum of the weekend left and uh, the Delhi guys have the least. And there is uh, the French Open has already started and the first match is going to be an upset. So one game is left so you guys can go and catch up. And thanks a lot. Uh, the June agenda is uh, finalized uh, and we have uh, three nice webinars coming in June. The first one is on uh, THR uh, implants A to Z. So, good night for now and thanks a lot. Stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving this. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.